Highway Development Management Initiative uh, webinar brought to you courtesy of Lagos Business School Center for Infrastructure Policy Regulation and Advancement, uh, the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing under the able leadership of um, Honorable uh, His Excellency Babatunde Raji Fashola, the Honorable Minister for Works and Housing and uh, the Infrastructural Concession and Regulatory Commission under the able and energetic leadership of uh, Engineer Chidi Izowa. Um, this is the Lagos Business School. My name is Bongo Adi. We are glad that you have um, come to join us today, despite your busy schedule. This is the one of this kind, so I think this is a kind of a road show where the Federal Minister of Works and Housing is bringing to us one of the innovative solutions they have brought to ramp up um, uh, PPP deployment, uh, to ramp up the, the level of infrastructure assets in Nigeria. So today is one of his kind. We're happy to are here to join us. So we have very distinguished uh, uh, panelists as well as, as ministers of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. We have the Honorable Minister of Finance, uh, Budget and National Planning, uh, his, Her Excellency Zainab Ahmed. We have the Honorable Minister of Transport, uh, Transport here with us as well, um, His Excellency Rotimi Ameshi. We have uh, the Honorable Minister of Aviation. He's supposed to be with us, I suppose, uh, Senator Hadi Sirika. Uh, we have the Honorable, um, at the Attorney General and the Honorable Minister of Justice also with us. Um, of course, we have distinguished panelists from both uh, public and private sector leading organizations in the infrastructure value chain uh, who will constitute the panel. Today, so we have a, a program that is very rich. Uh, this is not the first of the webinars that we're having. Actually, this is the third one. The first one, we had uh, that one on healthcare, PPPs on healthcare, where we partner with uh, uh, Acreel from uh, India. The second one was the knowledge exchange webinar we had this time last week uh, with the Turkish uh, national government PPP uh, practitioners, as well as the drivers of the PPP in Turkey. We know that Turkey is a, one of the leading countries when it comes to the deployment of PPP to solve uh, infrastructure problems in the world. So we learned from them today. Uh, we are also showcasing what we've been able to achieve in our own climb here in Nigeria. So we have uh, the Honorable Minister of Works and Housing with his team in collaboration with the ICRC, bringing to us the innovative solution they have brought to ramp up uh, road infrastructure. So this is a very engaging one and it promises to be interesting. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Chris Obeche, the Deputy Dean of Lagos Business School to give us his welcome remark. After that, um, the uh, DG of uh, Infrastructure Concession and Regulatory Commission, Engineer Izuwa, will also take the stage to give us an opening remark before we have the keynote address from the Honorable Minister of Works and Housing, uh, Babajide uh, Fashola, Babatunde Fashola. So he will give us his, uh, the keynote address. Then at the end of that, we will take some ministerial statements for the various ministers here with us. Then at the end of that, we'll also have a, a statement from the Chairman, Senate Committee on Works, and the Chairman, House Committee on Works as well. Uh, they are all here with us. Then after that, we have the first session which will be the uh, overview of the um, Highway Development Management Initiative uh, from the, those who design it. So we have uh, uh, architect Alozier and then um, engineer Femi who will lead, take us on that. Then at the end of that, there will be the first interactive session where we take questions and answers from the participants. So please, this is a very open session, uh, very transparent. Please feel free, ask your questions, very constructive critics. Uh, the, the government is open to all of that. So we welcome all your questions and comments. Now, after the first uh, session, we now go into the second session, we will, which will deal with the financing options and the risk assessment in this new initiative. And moderating that panel session will be Engineer Chidi Zuwa. Now, for that session, we have distinguished team of panelists. I'll be introducing them when we get there. Uh, so that is how it goes. And then after that, we take another round of questions and answers and then uh, we will recap and then come to a close. This is gonna be a three hour session, um, but do not worry uh, for the time because I promise you, 
like the last time, it's going to be very engaging and riveting from beginning to the end. So without further ado, may I invite Professor Chris Obeche, the Deputy Dean of Lagos Business School, to give us the welcoming remark from Lagos Business School. Professor Obeche, please. Thank you very much, Bongo. Honorable ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome you to this special stakeholder engagement webinar. I'm sure most of you present are familiar with Lagos Business School. But just to remind you, at Lagos Business School, we are committed to developing responsible leaders. Can you hear me? We, have we can hear you. Thank you. So I said, Lagos Business School, we are committed to developing responsible leaders who bring in society, environment, and governance into the organization's DNA. By that, we mean people who are conscious of the way they run their organizations, taking care of people, the planet, and also looking at, at profits. But that's not all. Over the years, our role has been in nurturing the beds for Nigeria's private sector development. And it's important to note the role, the very first set of chief executives we developed in our first chief executive development program in 1991, that they played a significant role in establishing the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. We have over the years contributed in grooming managerial talents across industry sectors in Nigeria. And right now we have over 6,000 strong alumni networks spanning across the leadership of Nigeria's private and public sectors. And we recently established a center that is run by Bongo, which we we, we set up to push governance, public policy, and infrastructure adequacy through capacity development, stakeholder, stakeholder engagement, and impact research. So we call it CIPRA. And CIPRA is part of the hosting teams. CIPRA at Lagos Business School focuses on mainstreaming of effective PPPs in the delivery of infrastructure in Nigeria through capacity building at both national and sub-national level. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that the public and private sectors in Nigeria must work together to get our economy working at full steam. So PPP is the way. It's not another option. It's the way forward and it's applicable to all sectors of our economy. It's not restricted to just works, roads. It's applicable even in services. At LBS, we are willing to work closely with any public sector organization in driving effective PPP in this space. So feel free to partner with us. We not just bring in research into it, but we also help in developing a capacity at both ends, both the private and the public sector. So we are available to work with any government organization. So we are not just there for public sec private sector, but we are willing to partner with also the public sector at state level, at national level. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a successful and fruitful conversation. And I hope that this conversation will lead towards critical development of our infrastructure going forward. Once more, I welcome you to this special webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Obeche. Professor Obeche is a professor of strategy and international business, as well as a member of the management board of Lagos Business School and now the deputy dean. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, so we move forward. Uh, next, uh, before I go to the next, permit me to welcome um, the Honorable Minister of State uh, for labor and employment um, in the person of um, uh, His Excellency Festus Keyamo, who is also here with us. 
I will be welcoming on the dignitaries. They're all here, so just uh, do not hold it against me uh, for breach of protocol. But I think everything will work out at the end. So may I invite uh, um, Engineer Chidi to give his welcoming remark? Yeah, Bongo, thank you very much. You know, at these sessions, I really often don't know what to say. Uh, but just to sort of share my excitement that, you know, the way infrastructure is taking central, you know, to our country. I want to sort of recognize the thought, the force of ministers we have here. We've got five major ministers of the Federal Republic of Nigeria here. I want to thank the, uh, the chairman of the Senate Committee on Works, who represents the Senate, the Red Chamber. I want also to thank the chairman of the House Committee on Works, who represents the Green Chamber, all the panelists, you know, the, our invited guests, we're already at 600 attendees all over the place. This is uh, very great. I really just want to sort of share two quotes. You know, the first one is from Chairman Mao. You know, Chairman Mao is a communist, but he's reputed to have said, if you want to grow rich, build a road. It just demonstrates how critical, you know, roads are to national development and the next day. So the next one is uh, a really very haunting quote by the Honorable Minister for Interior, Ogbeni Ralph Aregboshola, who said, and I quote, History will hold us accountable if we do not develop innovative ways for the private sector to fund infrastructure in Nigeria. So it just shows that we're sitting on something that is extremely uh, very great. You know, in addition to thanking everybody, I want to especially thank, you know, Luke and Emeya, you know, who is from the South African National Roads Authority, who is here with us. You know, we're very grateful that uh, Sandra is here to share their expertise and their knowledge. There are two gentlemen who have, you know, really spent time trying to support road development in Nigeria, who are in the audience but not in the panel. But please permit me to recognize them. The first one is Mr. Nazir Ali, who was here in November last year with us. Nazir Ali is a founding MD of Sanra, the South African National Roads Authority. He was the MD for 15 years. And if you've gone to South Africa and seen the beautiful network there, you know, Nazir played a very strong role, you know, in doing that. And we welcome him and we look forward to his uh, contribution to this process. The next person is uh, Mr. Gujindra Haldia. You know, for those who know India, Gujindra, you know, developed, you know, the contrast and, you know, the system for that in India. Gujindra is very sick. He would have loved to be here today, you know, with the uh, chairman of the National Highways Authority. So we pray for good health for Gujindra, but he's somebody who wishes Nigeria very well. So essentially, you know, we are here, we, we would share our thoughts it's for the progress of Nigeria. His Excellency President Mohamed Buhari is very clear that he wants to create prosperity. The most powerful way to democratize prosperity is through the road network in a country. I don't want to repeat my usual quote, uh, you know, John Kennedy said, because I've said it so much times, and that it might, uh, I might start to sound like a broken record. At this juncture, I just want to welcome everybody and say, God must, will, shall, and truly bless Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Izuwa. Um, okay, so we now go forward. Um, I think we will now take the keynote address from the Honorable Minister of Works and Housing, His Excellency Babatunde Fashola. Um, if the team is ready, please, we would like to have a projection of the slides and please, uh, Honorable Minister, could you take the center stage? Thank you, Bongo, and uh, thank you to all of the now 607 participants at this webinar. Uh, my appreciation is deep to all the participants uh, and uh, without being partisan to the honorable ministers, my colleagues, uh, the members of the parliament in the red and green chamber, uh, all of whom have been acknowledged, let me thank them again. And uh, to say that uh, this is a very important meeting. I will start first by saying that what we seek to do today falls in line with the economic recovery and growth plan of the country, which has been in implementation for almost four years now. And it falls in line with the undoubted commitment of the leader of our government, President Buhari, to radically renew, revamp, and increase Nigeria's stock of infrastructure. Let me express my delight in the fact that what will be presented to you today is totally homegrown. 
homegrown in the sense that it was developed in the ministry by our staff, young and old, and also in collaboration with the ICRC. And this is a totally made in Nigeria initiative. It is also consistent with our economic policy to create what we need and use what we create. But I am happy to also say that it is already exciting and eliciting interest beyond the shores of Nigeria. In a nutshell, the Highway Development and Management Initiative, HDMI, seeks to bring multidimensional resources of skills, manpower, finance, technology, and much more into a large portion of Nigeria's national highway govern governance, especially starting with the 35,000 kilometers of federal highway network. What this initiative seeks to achieve is to bring order, accountability, and profitable entrepreneurship to the operation, management, and maintenance of our federal highways. Please don't forget that. Order, accountability, and profitable entrepreneurship. What we have therefore done is to first identify 10 highways which represent just 2,225 kilometers, and which is just about 6.4% of our 35,000 kilometer federal highway network. And this will constitute the first phase. So let me say that again. 10 highways representing 2,225 kilometers, or 6.4% of 35,000 kilometers as a first phase of the HDMI. On each road, we see opportunities for erection of gantries and directional signage, all of which our ministry has designed, standardized, and costed. We see opportunities for tow plazas. Again, these are already been designed and standardized. We see opportunities for way bridges. Some of them are already constructed and need completion in some cases, and also the construction of warehouses to operate the way bridges of flood excess cargo, store wet and dry cargo. We see opportunities for street lighting and advertising opportunities. We also see opportunities for rest houses whose sites have already been identified. We have developed concept designs with facilities for catering, for lodging, fueling, which is optional to whoever wins the bid and operates it, car repairs as the operator may choose, uh, spare parts sales, vulcanizing, and all of this which can happen at the rest areas. We see opportunities for road repairs, maintenance, vegetation clearing, and enormous labor employment. We also see the possibilities for towing vehicle operation for recovery of broken down vehicles. We see opportunities for lane marking with thermoplastic paints to the highest quality, for waste management and refuse collection on our highways. Also for right of way management for telecommunication assets, to lay fiber and all other related support infrastructure. Of course, we see opportunities for ambulance services with first responders during emergencies. These are just a few of the possibilities that we foresee as we intend to optimize the operations of what currently exists. Okay, so I'm going to pause there. Some of these things exist on many parts of our highway already. So what this HDMI therefore seeks to achieve is to optimize them in a way that I said brings order, brings accountability and profitable entrepreneurship. So we're also currently strengthening our own internal processes as the oversight ministry. And some of the things we intend to share with the public in a couple of weeks, perhaps, which are in development, is what we call know your road and own your network. This is a, um, a software called Cohims, which will be an updated real-time database 
for our entire road network. Uh, by the time we are fully operational, it is possible for any Nigerian with access to the software to then say, I have a problem on road X, who is in charge of it? And we will know that it is the engineer XYZ who is in charge of it. And these are his details, phone number, and possibly email or whatever contact to highlight issues we have on that highway with them. Ladies and gentlemen, what we undertake today, the HDMI is not an event. It is a vision of the tomorrow that we see. And these stakeholders consultations, like the one we held with the Senate, Joint Senate and House Committees on Works last week, are the very first steps on that journey. But as this journey progresses, our research and studies suggest that on this journey of the first phase alone, remember that first phase, 10 routes, 2,225 kilometers, on that first phase of the journey alone, we see a possible investment of about 160 billion naira, approximating to about 16 billion naira per route to unleash opportunities for prosperity. So again, this ties in very clearly with the president's challenge to all of us that look, within a decade, this country can lift 100 million people out of poverty. Just managing the roads well alone improves not only the value of the assets around it, the landed property by many food, it creates uh, opportunities for prosperity. And once people begin to get onto the ladder of prosperity, they're essentially saying bye-bye to poverty. And so we anticipate that there will be 46,694 direct jobs that span construction, installation, fabrication, security, and waste management, just to mention a few. In the first phase alone, the indirect job opportunities and the spin-offs remain for me a matter of excitable and mouth-watering expectation. Distinguished participants, since this consultation meeting with the National Assembly last week, which was widely reported in the news, I have received several inquiries, all of which are positive. I have also started receiving written proposals in the office, which with respect, I like to say in this public forum, is not the way to go. Don't send written proposals to our office. It's not the way to go. And I like to make that very clear. The way to go, in my view, is for those who are interested to form themselves into consortiums of road construction, road maintenance companies, financiers, toll operators, rest house operators, advertising companies, lane marking experts, refuse managers, ambulance service providers, and so on. And from now, begin to tour, visit, inspect the route that interests you. That for me is the way to go. Very soon, in collaboration with the ICRC, we will announce the details of the procurement process in a very public and transparent manner that allows the most effective bid to compete vigorously in a process that delivers service to Nigerians. This, in my view, will be the way to go. I am sure that the DGICRC will have a word to say about this procurement process in the course of these discussions. So to all interested persons, start preparing so that you will be ready to compete when the process opens. We will not countenance any bid or proposal sent to us that does not conform with the rules prescribed by the RCRC, ICRC. So in closing, I thank you all for listening. I encourage all of us to participate very actively and purposefully in this webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, His Excellency, the Honorable Minister for Works and Housing. Uh, as I said in the beginning, this is a very innovative solution. Uh, so as he has put it, managing the road well creates opportunity for prosperity. And I don't think anybody will agree less. So let's move forward. Now, I, a lot of questions are coming up. May I remind our distinguished audience, if you want to ask a question, please put your name. 
put your name at the end of your question. We will not entertain any anonymous question. If you put your question anonymously, um, uh, we will be reluctant to give you any answer. But please include your name. If possible, include your email address. So if you are not able to address your question during the course of this uh, webinar, be rest assured that we will um, address it eventually. I'll send it to you via email. Please put your name, include your name, your email address in all the questions or comments that you are bringing forward. Okay, so I will now call on the Honorable Minister for Finance, Budget, and National Planning, Your Excellency Zainab Ahmed. Ajia, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank good you. morning, everyone. Um, let me especially recognize uh, the Honorable Minister of Works and Housing and my other ministerial colleagues that are in this forum, the DGICRC, uh, the Lagos Business School, and all the distinguished panelists and participants that have joined us today. I'm really pleased and excited about this, this program. When Engineer Fashala was, read, uh, uh, Mr. Fashala was reading up the opportunities, I kept seeing more and more that could arise. And why I'm excited about this is because this will be one of the most important ways that we can provide infrastructure that are required today without uh, government funding, which is really very, very limited at this time. In recent years, everyone knows that we're experiencing huge funding deficits and also our budgetary provisions for development of roads and other infrastructure has been quite inadequate. So this is a very good um, a way to concentrate on so that we can bridge the infrastructure deficit using the philosophy of partnership with the private sector and also leveraging on the specialization of the private sector and also the uh, investment appetite of the private sector and also the financing uh, uh, capability of the private sector. Partnerships between the public and the private sector in the development of roads is not new in Nigeria, is not new in Africa, but for some reason we have not been able to get it right. And I think by the concept that has been outlined by Honorable Minister Fashola that we will get it right this time, that we will be able to develop uh, roads using PPP projects for the benefit of the citizens. I want to assure the, uh, the private sector uh, interested parties that our ministry uh, will work closely with the HDMI project, with the Ministry of uh, Works and Housing, and also with the private sector to ensure that this project is fully supported and that it actually succeeds. Uh, DGRCLC, thank you very much for, for organizing this. And uh, uh, we hope also that you will find ways within your own rules and regulations to make this process fast track. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget, and National Planning. Um, I know that uh, the Minister of Transport is also with us, um, His Excellency Roti Mahameshi. Please, um, Your Excellency, it's your turn now, your ministerial statement. Yeah, he, he's uh, he's away uh, from. Maybe he stepped out. Okay, so let's let's go to uh, Senator Hadis uh, Sirika, the Honorable Minister of Aviation. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bongo and uh, Honorable Minister of uh, Works and Housing, uh, my colleagues, Honorable Ministers the DGICRC and the entire Lagos Business School. It's indeed a pleasure for me to once again uh, participate in this very important webinar. And uh, more so today because it's uh, an area that I have passion for, which is transportation uh, by extension highway. And the key word there is that I think uh, from my perspective is management, development and management of uh, highways. Uh, highways have been developed. They could further be developed, but perhaps uh, uh, the management uh, component of uh, uh, the game is what has been amiss in this country. And certainly, and the opportunities um, 
uh, unquantifiable, there are many, and uh, they all uh, add up to a very robust economy. And I think this is a very, very uh, clever move by uh, my colleague, and I think um, this is worth celebrating, and I'm sure it will be a game changer in the scheme of things. Um, civil aviation has taken the lead in these uh, PPP arrangements. Um, so far, we've received seven uh, uh, compliance certificates from ICRC, and we've seen the wisdom in doing so. So having uh, uh, works and housing to carefully develop this uh, is uh, heartwarming, and, and uh, I'm sure my sister will be relieved. Uh, so a request for, for funds going to her desk will significantly reduce, uh, in, in other words, her income will definitely increase. And the assets of the people will remain with them while Nigeria gets service. This is just uh, what obtains globally in countries that are very rich, including those that are the richest nations in the world, uh, go to PPPs and then do this uh, kind of arrangement. Qatar is a classical example of where uh, one of the richest countries, if not the richest country on earth, still do this um, arrangement. So I think it's noble. I think it's timely. I congratulate uh, the Ministry of uh, Works and Housing, its minister and its um, staff, uh, and all of you that are putting this together. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, would listen, would learn, would um, participate, and uh, I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Hade Sirika, the Minister of Aviation. So we now go to uh, the Honorable Minister of State, Labor and Employment, uh, His Excellency Festus Keyamo. Honorable Minister, if you're here, please. Well, transport is back. You know, why don't we go to transport then I uh, can get back. To okay, transport is back. Um, if uh, if uh, the Honorable Minister of Transport is here, so we may, we want to listen to you as well while we wait for Mr. Keyamo. Let me. Uh, okay. That, let me first apologize for my little absence, and thank the Honorable Minister for works and the. DG ICRC for the opportunity to speak here. I also want to welcome my colleagues and all of you who have participated, including the who are participating, including the distinguished senator and the honorable member of House of Reds who are here present. You know, the administration of His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari is steadfast in the development of sustainable infrastructure. This is evident from the achievements recorded so far across the intermodal transport system. We are aware of the railway development, as you know, in the country, as much as the roads that are being constructed through the Federal Ministry of Works. Especially the um, we talked about the standard gauge railway construction that is going across the country. There is no doubt that a good road network is one of the most critical transportation infrastructure in any country. A well-constructed and maintained road system is important for the development and the economic growth of the country. But good transportation networks are expensive to build and maintain. The emergence of COVID-19 has made it even more difficult for various governments to laterally fund public infrastructure projects, such as roads, rail, and others. Nigeria is no different. It is highly commendable that the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing has risen to the occasion in a very timely manner. And the Ministry of Transport will do all that is required of it to ensure the success of this initiative. I would also like to give credit to the ICRC for being steadfast in this quest to ensure that the right enabling environment is created for the success of PPPs in our country. I thank you, especially for the contributions you made on the narrow gauge even though it was, at the end of the day, it was the situation that we found ourselves with uh, the company involved, which is G, and the current contribution you're making with the Bonnie Deep Sea port and the uh, industrial park in Port Harcourt. Let Nigeria must indeed focus on rapid transportation infrastructure delivery via PPP as a way to revive our economy from the devastating impacts of COVID-19. 
I hope that this webinar will serve as a good platform towards the delivery of the clearly defined objectives. Thank you all, and may God bless all of you. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency. Um, with that, we now go to uh, uh, the Honorable Minister of State, Labor and Employment, uh, Festus Kayamo. If you are ready, we are ready to listen to you, sir. Okay, if he's still uh, preparing, um, we listen to Senator Mohamed Aliero, the Chairman, Senate Committee on Works. He has been with us from the start. Distinguished Senator, please. Honorable Minister, is your turn. Honorable uh, Chairman of the Senate Committee, Adamo Alero, is your turn to speak, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DGICLC. Uh, let me start by adopting the existing protocol properly established. Uh, let me also say that I'm very glad to be part of this very important webinar session. The Public-Private Partnership for National Highway Development and Management Initiative. In developing countries such as Nigeria, infrastructure investment gaps have become a major issue that is affecting the construction of the new infrastructure or the maintenance of the existing ones. Hence, various governments around the world are exploring public-private partnership as viable and uh, acceptable alternative means of addressing this recurring issue of lack of sufficient public funding. This is why the Senate His your, microphone is muted. Your, your microphone is muted, sir. From where he said, this is why the Senate. <laughs> OK. Can you unmute yourself, sir? Um, anyway, OK. So let, let's. Uh, no, no, he's, he's, he's unmuted now. That will be. Okay, good. As the National Assembly is back from recess. Thank you for the invitation, and we look forward to bringing the much needed infrastructure development to our country through initiatives like this. Thank you all, and God bless you, Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Aliero, uh, the Chairman, Senate Committee on Works. I'm not sure that the Chairman, House Committee on Works, Honorable Abubakar, Kabiru is here with us. So in his absence, and I don't know if uh, the Honorable Minister of State Labor and Employment uh, is around, but while we wait for them, um, let's go on now to the main events, which is the presentation or the overview of the um, Highway Development Management Value Added Concession Initiative. And to present that will be the designers of this innovative scheme um, uh, that will be architect Alozie. She will be giving us the governing principles. When she's done, engineer Femi Akinyelure will uh, take on the project information. And then to lead us through the procurement process, a lot of people are asking, already asking questions about uh, timelines and the procurement uh, process. Um, architect Alozie and engineer Izuwa will uh, take us on that. So uh, let us start right now. Um, I will call on architect Alos here to present the overview, the governing I mean, principles of no, the... Bunga, I, I, Bunga, I was going to make a suggestion, if it's acceptable okay. to the Honorable Minister of Works. I think that the ministers who are here present with us have spent quite some time preparing to make their statements. I was going to suggest that we, while it wasn't in the schedule, let's take a goodwill message from South Africa, you know, from Luke and Emeya, as a way to buy time and get back the minister. Because once we start this, it's going to be difficult to go back. I don't know whether this is... a uh, I don't need the Honorable Minister to my suggestion. Honorable Mr. Fashola, 
you're, you're muted. I have no objection. Okay, well, I, I think uh, I, I will suggest, you know, Lou, let, let's say, uh, Lou, can, can you give us a small goodwill message from South Africa? You've seen what our minister has said. I mean, uh, you know, how do we, uh, you know, how do, how do things look and how do we take it from here? It would be nice to hear from you. And I want to thank you very much. I know uh, it's been very challenging for you to get on here, but we're really, you know, excited to have you on the call. Yeah, I think, I mean, Chairperson, uh, ministers, all protocol observe, thanks for the opportunity from us here down in the south in South Africa to join you today. I think as a number of the speakers have elaborated, it's no longer business as usual if you look at what's happened with COVID-19. If you look at what we're doing with technology now with webinars, which is becoming the norm of not having to travel any longer to a locality, but we're all doing it digitally or remotely. It is going to impact all the infrastructure that we're managing and the demand for infrastructure going forward. And one will need to take all of these into consideration. And I think as been alluded to by a number of the discussions so far, all the countries now post COVID are embarking on major PPP programs to try and stimulate their economies. So what one needs to understand is that we are all going to be competing for the same funds, the pool of funds that are available in the private sector. And the winners are going to be those whose projects are able to provide the highest return to the investors at the lowest risk. So I think what we need to appreciate, uh, I won't compare it to a soccer game because then South Africa is going to lose. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe a rugby match, uh, I'll compare it. We are going to be, as countries throughout the globe, competing for these limited private sector funds that are available for investment into PPPs going forward. It is no longer as it was three months ago where there was a limited supply of projects and adequate funding. It's actually quite the opposite. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, that's from South Africa. Ingenizua, you want to interject here? Mr. Kiyamo is there. Okay. The Minister, um, Honorable Minister of State, Labor and Employment is back with us. So now we're back to you. We've been waiting for you. So that's a goodwill message from Liu from South Africa. All right, so you need to unmute yourself. You're on mute. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, the protocols, I'm not too sure how many of my colleagues are there, but um, the Honorable Ministers here present, the DG, Infrastructure Concession Regulatory Commission, my brother, Engineer Chidi, Casey Zua, Permanent Secretary, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be participating in this webinar session that aims to discuss the Highway Development and Management Initiative launched by the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing in collaboration with the Infrastructure Concession Regulatory Commission. It is common knowledge that the Nigerian economy has been affected not only by the effect of the pandemic, but also by the drop in oil prices. One of the major pillars of economic recovery for Nigeria is true, is true job creation. This is also in line with Mr. President's promise to lift Nigerians, 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years. The Highway Development and Management Initiative will not only help to bridge the financial gap in provision of quality infrastructure, but also create much needed jobs for the citizens of this country. Therefore, the successful implementation of this initiative would be a welcome development for our country. As a result, 
this plausible initiative will receive the full support of myself and my senior colleague, um, Senator Chris Ngege, would work with the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing in engaging the unions and relevant stakeholders under our jurisdiction to ensure proper awareness of the initiative. We assure potential investors that our ministry will work with the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing to ensure this initiative is successful. Thank you for inviting me and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, His Excellency Festus Keyamo, SAN, the Honorable Minister of State, Labor and Employment. I think with that, we are done with the protocol, uh, the ministerial statements, we've taken them, and we've got the goodwill message from South Africa. And now I uh, would like us to drive into the main event, which is the presentation of the HDMI. Um, the Highway Development Management Value Added Concession Initiative by the Federal Minister, uh, Minister of Works and Housing. So to take us through the governing principles will be Architect Alose, Architect Mrs. Alose, I think she's one of the key drivers within the ministry. Then when she's done, the project information will be given to us by Femi Akinye Lure. Then um, the third component of this uh, phase, this session, will be the procurement process, which we'll be hearing from uh, architect Alozier and engineer Izowa. So may I hand over now to architect Mrs. Alozier to present the governing principles of HDMI. Attorney General, who has been called by the president of the villa, to give us the Attorney General's uh, you know, goodwill message while we try to sort out the So please, uh, Bungo, let's go on with the Attorney General. Okay, okay, the Attorney General's uh, step, uh, ministerial statement. Please uh, go ahead. Okay, good afternoon. Let me first of all apologize. The Attorney General is supposed to be part of this uh, program. Of, unfortunately, he has to be called to the villa and he has already directed me. Are you, are you, are you am, I with, am I with you? Yes, we are with, hearing you loud and clear. Okay. Okay. He has given me the directive to first of all congratulate you and also send his uh, apology and he has directed me to make some statements and I so do. Uh, it is uh, with great pleasure that uh, on behalf of the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Justice and the Ministry of Justice welcome you to this uh, virtual meeting aimed at improving the program structure and to obtain relevant inputs of the general public road users investors and stakeholders on the activation of the federal government national policy on public-private partnership of our nation's federal highways. Permit me, permit me to delve straight to the point by stating that the present initiative of the PPP for our nation's uh, federal trunk roads is indeed laudable. The program in essence is aimed at attracting private investment and expertise to the development of our nation's federal highways under the regulatory guidance of uh, Infrastructural Concession Regulation Commission, which is indeed one of the major economic recovery policies of the federal government. The initiative will further focus on job creation and improve the standard value of our federal route for greater economic particip participation within the country and targeted at procuring the transformation of on our nation's federal highways to viable world-class economic corridors. I am to inform you that the Attorney General uh, of the Federation is committed to providing requisite legal support in form of uh, amendments, uh, executive orders, and other legal instruments that may be required to ensure that this uh, laudable project comes to fruition. Let me quickly uh, uh, inform you that uh, gathering of the activities of the government, well, that's on the Ministry of Justice, please, uh, of the Ministry of Justice. Already the federal government through the office of the Honorable Attorney has commenced the process of initiating modalities of the implementation of section 14 of section 1H of the Federal Road Maintenance Agency 
Amendment Act 2007, which, if you recall, the, this act introduced 5% user charge on pump price of petrol and diesel as additional source of funds to FEMA, of which 40% of the 5% user charge will accrue to FEMA's and 60% to be utilized by the establishment of road, uh, uh, road, uh, state roads maintenance agency. This will further help in the required counterpart partnership funding required by the federal government. In, in, in doing this, we are already speaking with the governor's forum and uh, to ensure that this, uh, for the 40 and 60% is uh, paid so that uh, the roads will be uh, would be motorable and this it will be an additional fund. And also, let me also state that uh, another area of importance is the dispute resolution. And the ministry, the ministry is working with other arms of government to ensure that there is special judicial arrangement of, for PPP related dispute so that such dispute can be determined speedily and uh, timelessly. And also, in this regard, we also intend to intervene with. Uh, effective the risk PPP investment to private sector participants and ensure project continuation and compensation as may be required. The foregoing are some of the actions of the Federal Ministry of Justice and which we intend, we, which we consider that we ensure that the PPP framework and federal government works effectively and efficiently and that it delivers the, the developmental value to the people of Nigeria. Then, and let me quickly uh, end up by commending this uh, excellency, the president, for his economic recovery and sustainability drive to which the present scheme represents. Let me also extend my commendation to Honorable Minister of Works and Housing, Baba Tunde Fashola, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing, the Infrastructure Concession Regulatory Commission, particularly my very good friend Shidi, and the Lagos Business School Center for Infrastructure Policy Regulation and Advancement, that's a CIPRA, for, the, for bringing to reality the present initiative aimed at activating our nation's uh, national policy on uh, public and pri private partnership on our roads. We well, thank you very much and God bless Nigeria. Thank you very much, uh, sir, representing the Attorney General and the Minister of uh, Justice for the Federation. Okay, um, I don't. We uh, we go to Lou and uh, and uh, Madu, Wada of African Finance Corporation, where we try to, you know, sort this out. Okay, yeah. Lou, we're ready. Okay, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I think, I mean, just a bit of background, as indicated in terms of one of the three concessions we have in South Africa, it was actually the first 30-year concession we entered in back in 1998. So it's virtually midterm now. It ends uh, roughly 2028. Uh, it is 570 kilometers of road that was fully concessioned in terms of a design, build, operate, and transfer to the private sector. And as it indicated, what makes it unique, it actually transcends countries, which makes it a bit more complex in terms of the day-to-day -day management. But what, for example, these concessions, these PPPs has enabled us, I think it's very important to understand when you look at the life cycle cost of roads, uh, only about 10% of the cost relates to the actual agency cost of building, operating, and maintaining it. 90% of the cost relates to the road users that are making use of the road on a daily basis. So if you can provide improved infrastructure sooner to your road users in your country, your economy benefits because the benefits of improved infrastructure is reduced traveling time, reduced cost of uh, moving cargo or freight. So the big beneficiary in the end is the economy of the country in this by the fact that you are reducing your cost 
of operating your economy. And in both of our countries, more than 90% of all movements in our countries are reliant on road-based transport. And that's why investing into infrastructure not only create the initial jobs during construction, but it severely benefits the economy in the long term because of the reduction in your operational costs. Lou, thank you very much. Uh, you know, wh wh why the, uh, you know, why uh, Femi and uh, Madam are setting up? Amadou? Oh, we're here. We're here. Yeah. Amadou, yeah. can you hear me? I mean, you know, I think what is we're very interesting now. about the Bakoneto Road is that... <laughs> I think we can hear them now. Okay, you can hear them. Okay. We're ready now. We're ready. Okay, so if you're ready, uh, let's move with you. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, you want to be together. I can get that. Please. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, the Honorable Minister for Works and Housing, um, Baba Raji Fashola, SAN, all other ministers here present. Um, I'll prefer to say all protocols duly observed. Um, the Highway Development Management Initiative document is a robust um, piece of work and that intends to rev revolutionize the highway sector and create the enabling environment for private involvement in the construction and management of nation's highways and ancillary road infrastructure. Um, the project is good or apt in view of the dwindling resources and growing pressure on our highways and it is poised to be an enduring legacy for the nation's highway development. The document uh, speaks to a whole range of issues central of which is the value added initiative, the land value and land value capture initiative. I'm going to speak on the governing principle and a bit of the procurement angle and I intend to be brief, as brief as possible. Um, the initiative that is a document is divided into two sides. We have the value added concession and then we have the unbundled asset um, approvals. Um, the two concession is looking at two windows, two options. One of the option of the concession will include road pavement and maintenance and possible toll plaza construction. While the second one uh, will not include the road pavement nor the construction of the toll plaza. The concessionaire is responsible for managing the entire right of way as well as developing the route. And he will be able to recoup their investment through revenue generating assets that will develop, that will be, uh, that will develop on that route. Then the unbundled um, assets, under it, we have what we call the generating asset, which uh, will be unbundled on that uh, mm -hmm. axis. They are then given to individuals to build, operate, and maintain as the case may be. And it is peculiar to each uh, route. So it's based on the characteristic of that route. And the regulatory framework, uh, it's going to represent a structure where the value added concessionaire will be working directly with the, um, with the ministry. So the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing will be working with ICRC, who are the regulators. They work with the concessionaire, and then that is the regulatory hierarchy that you've seen on the diagram. And without a concession, the road reserve user will liaise directly with the ministry to obtain building operation, maintenance license, or agreement. This structure exists only under unbundled approvals. And the roles and responsibility of each uh, regulatory framework for both the categories of the HDMI is outlined, uh, uh, is outlined below. We have the Federal Ministry of Works um, who, has, who has the oversight duties on this initiative and it ensures that all levels of structure and all stakeholders of the HDMI, both the VAC, the value added concession and the unbundled asset approval categories adhere to the terms of the agreement. 
It will ensure that the provision and constant updates of all design and standards and policies relevant to the highway maintenance and development. It will also be in charge of monitoring the system using its robust in-house highway management system being uh, handled by the highway engineers. We also have the uh, SPV con the concessionaire. They will develop the, the highway right of way inclusive, but not limited to construction of the road pavement and the directional signage. I will not go into details on all of them because the minister has covered quite a lot of them. And I think I'll just uh, bring out the highlights. So uh, under the roles and responsibility, we have the Federal Ministry of uh, Works and Housing, we have the concessionaire, we have the ICRC who is the regulator, and then the road reserve um, user. And under the governing principle and the design specification document, we have design specifications which are available, including the road furniture to be developed across the routes. Under, a high, under the Highway Development uh, Management Initiative Manual, all are output specifications. They're not prescript prescriptive and instead serve as a guidance for private partners. They are all outlined in our initiative manual. Um, most of the um, unbundled assets include the grant of the highway right of way, the tolling services policy document, the towing services, the advertising, and the waste management. Um, the monitoring, the minister has already spoken about it, is the issue of the know your route, on your network, and also the software. All this will be given to all private developers. Everything will be transparent, and um, it will be easy for anyone to be able to hop into our new initiative. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this session, this section of the presentation talks about the project information um, itself. So as uh, Mrs. Alozier has just said, we have a very detailed initiative manual which has been developed, which, which essentially covers all the governing principles that she has just described in a lot more detail because we're not able to present every single aspect today, but that document also includes all the design specifications and all the regulatory um, aspects of this initiative, all in one document, and that will be downloadable by uh, our private partners. Whether it is you are going for the unbundled assets approval or you're part of the uh, value added concession consortiums who will be coming up once we open up uh, the procurement. I would also mention while I'm on this slide that we also have developed a project information memorandum on 10 of the routes, which we are bringing up in this first phase. And that would also be available to our partners when the procurement begins. Now, a lot of you would also want to know how we came about this 10 routes and how you know, we were able to select this from the entire road network. We're, we're looking at Nigeria as one whole economic corridor. And for the success of this first phase, because the success of this first phase would drive the subsequent phases, uh, phases, we ensured that we took into consideration some major uh, critical criteria, uh, as it includes, you know, where the project is, at the moment in terms of contract completion because rehabilitation works are going on you know on a lot of all these routes at different levels of completion we also took into account the dualization of those roads because obviously a, dual, a dualized road would have a lot more traffic volume which makes it a lot more uh, bankable for our partners we also tried to within each route which i'll show uh, in the next slide Within each route, we try to break down the, um, the route into manageable lots um, so that we are not overburdening uh, any particular concessionaire. So generally, as I said, uh, we looked at the whole country as an economic route. This map uh, shows us some major points in our country, whether it is to do with agriculture and other aspects 
um, of our economy. And you would see in the subsequent slide how these routes that we have chosen fall within uh, this map. This is the list of the 10 routes that we have with their lots broken down the length of each of them and the corresponding traffic counts. Um, as I said, we have a more detailed project information memorandum, which has been developed because I know there'll be so many questions on these routes, but uh, in a few slides, uh, I would also show example of the type of information that we have on these routes. This map essentially shows the routes that have been chosen. And uh, if we superimpose this on the map of the economic routes, you would see clearly that this forms almost like an economic triangle around the whole country using uh, uh, the major cities of Abuja and Lagos uh, as center points. So this is just an example of the type of information that we've gathered on our routes, which also informed the selection um, of these 10 routes. Um, as you would see on the left-hand side, you'd see the last average traffic count that the um, Ministry of Works and Housing undertook. Um, in this section on the Abuja Lokoja route, we have an average traffic count of about 11,900 um, at the Lokoja end, while 17,000 or over at the Abuja end. And it also gives us a 20-year projection which I'm sure is very important uh, for our private partners. Um, same thing goes for this uh, Onicha Oweria bar route. The traffic counts are there, the level of completion is there, just to give us an idea of what to expect when we get uh, the bigger document. Now, we've spoken a lot about job creation and how this affects economic recovery post COVID 19. This slide shows an example, just an example of some of the jobs, the type of jobs that could be created across all the different parts of the gener uh, revenue generating assets on our highways. Just as the Honorable Minister mentioned earlier, this route covers uh, the footprint of this first phase will be about 2,225 kilometers, which is about 6.3% of the entire highway network. I'll just emphasize here that the capital in, uh, investment that the, uh, that the Honorable Minister was talking about has to do with the infrastructure that we expect our private partners to bring onto the highways as a form of development for those highways, building an ecosystem around it. So that 16 billion is not just money that we expect them to pay, but it's money we expect them to invest on the route. So in-house, as I said, we have done, you know, we have our design specifications and we've gone through our own in-house costings to be able to come up with these estimates. And these are just estimates that um, uh, we, we review over time. So that just gives an idea and a clarification uh, to those figures. Um, and in this slide, we look at what the uh, Honorable Minister said earlier, just a breakdown of the 40, 46,000 jobs that could be created from the value added um, concession. The same um, applies to the unbundled asset approvals. The only difference here I see is that for some of the assets the ministry had already built before would just be based on an operation and maintenance basis, while the value added uh, uh, concession is, is, is really, you know, the private sector coming in for the full uh, uh, concession. And also the under this unbundled asset approval, we also have opportunity there for, for local investors to come in to manage uh, economically viable areas in terms of either managing just a rest area, managing just a way bridge, along those routes. So that essentially, this is what that talks about. So on the whole, um, I think the, the benefit of this initiative cannot be overemphasized. Uh, when we look at the issue of fatigue on our roads and how it causes so much um, accidents, um, building of rest areas would help to resolve this issue. Job creation along, uh, along the routes that this value added concessions would uh, pass across would 
would stimulate some form of rural development along those uh, local communities. And finally, I think the issue of overloading and overloaded trucks, which is one of the major issues that uh, really affects uh, road pavements over time that the general public might not really pay so much attention to, uh, will be building way bridges to help to regulate this so that our road network can last a lot longer. So I would uh, pass this back on to Mrs. Alozi for the interesting parts that I am sure a lot of us are waiting to hear about. Thank you. Um, we're moving into the procurement process. Um, I'll just do the opening and um, the DG ICRC will give us highlights on the procurement process using the ICRC regulatory framework. Um, the uh, procurement process will be in conformity with um, the ICRC Act and guidelines and will be in two stages, the qualification stage and the bid stage. And at this time, I think I'll just hand over to Engineer Chidi to give um, our viewers a bit of the cake so they know what to do. Yeah, do you, do you, do you mind if I, uh, if I share my screen? Because uh, I think your screen share is a bit on the small side. Uh, but OK, well, I mean, let, 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 let's save on time. Let me go ahead. I think there are two elements to this you know, concession. The value added you, you, you can, you can also to... share your screen. Okay. You can let, share let, your screen, let, please. I think it's, let, it's important. Okay, let, let, let me share my screen. Uh, if they can. Okay, so Femi, um, you can unshare yours. Okay, uh, Femi, can... you have to share, okay. All right, so let me uh, permit you to now to share your screen. Can I share? Yes, yes you can. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Okay. Procurement so, process, yes. Yeah, no, I mean, so if, if you go, the first stage is the value added concession, which is really a concession. But, uh, you know, due to sensitivities in our environment, we've tried to create, just like the Honorable Minister said, we've tried to create a name, you know, for it, which is uh, a typical Nigerian name that is designed to address the sensitivities we have. So essentially, it follows a world class process you know, which is essentially, you've got a qualification stage, you know, where there is a proper qualification, there's a request for qualification, and then you've got a bid stage. Now for the unbundled assets, what unbundled assets are that if you go onto these routes, there are all sorts of economic opportunities that are available that really don't have to do with concession. So those are unbundled assets and those go through a direct procurement process, you know, which will be a hybrid process, you know, controlled by both the ICRC and the Bureau for you know, public procurement. So for the unbundled assets, you know, you will go through a process of, uh, you know, reviewing the initiative manual, you know, we're finalizing the documents. Once you launch the, uh, the COHE software and then go through the regulations, then you go to an expression of interest process, you evaluate those expressions of interest, and then you select, you know, the most people, then you can do your letters of approval. Fairly very simple, straightforward, quick process, because the idea is to attract investments as quick as you can with your bundled assets. And, and those are not really major things, but they add value and create jobs. Now, you know, these are the requirements for the bidders. I mean, these are the standard requirements that you would have if you, uh, you know, if you go through the, uh, you know, the public procurement act and things you need to do to be able to, uh, you know, to comply. So those are the mandatory requirements that people have to have. Now, let's go through the, uh, the actual process for the concessions, you know, the big things. You know, for us internally, you know, working with the ministry as a regulator, we are going through their documents, and I believe part of what is going to happen today is that after this, I mean, there are a couple of areas that are not finalized, that the feedback that comes enables them to finalize, you know, the outline business case, you know, which will come to the ICRC for certification. Once we certify the outline business case, then what means is that there is authorization for them to go into the procurement phase, just like the Honorable Minister of Aviation has said, for the airport concessions, we certified and presented the OBC certificates, you know, the, you know, a few days ago. That allows them to go into the procurement process. And the first part of that process is a request for qualification. So this will be an open, transparent, competitive process. 
the focus of the RFQ process is to sort of, you know, select separate people. You know, you want technically qualified bidders, you know, who will go into that particular process. And a lot of information will be available, the project information manual, you know, for all this, so that when people are looking at it, they understand what the output suggestions are and they can provide. Then once you have that advertisement for the RFQ, people will download it, submit the RFQ. At the end of that, you select a set of pre-qualified bidders. Now, those pre-qualified bidders are issued a request for proposal for their technical and financial proposal. And that would also go with the draft concession agreement. Now, that will be submitted and an evaluation will be done. Through the evaluation, a preferred bidder will be selected and a reserved bidder will be selected. There will be a negotiation with the preferred bidder. And once that is completed, the full business case in line with the ICRC process will be prepared and sent to us by the Federal Ministry of Works. Once we certify that full business case, then it will be sent to cabinet in line with the ICRC case. And then the, uh, you know, if cabinet approves it, then we will be able to sign the concession agreement and reach commercial close. And once we reach commercial close, the consortia will now be expected to reach financial close and then commence uh, you know, the process of work. So what you see here is a clear two-step process of developing the project, having a bankable you know, project you know, that's available. And then the next one is going into the procurement process to procure the PPP partners. This is a bit more detailed about the qualification and the bid stage. You know, in terms of what, you know, we'll go, I've explained that before about, you know, the RFQ document, you know, shortlisting, you know, and then the successful applicants and then the consortium and the detail. And once we go that we go to the B stage. Now the B stage, it's really like what you would have, you know, in any normal uh, B stage. But there is something, uh, you know, in addition to the RFQ, there are a number of documents, you know, in the data room and everything, you know, that will be required, you know, to enable you you know, make a proposal that is fit for purpose. Now, one question people would like to ask is the bidding criteria. You know, we haven't, from a regulatory point of view, you know, closed on the bidding criteria, but we are open. You know, there are several options that are available to government for the bidding criteria, but we would like to see feedback from here, what the appetite of the private sector is. What is being considered is revenue share, you know, highest MPV of annual concession fee, the MPV of entry fee of tolls and concession, and the hybrid of them, you know, land value capture and everything. There's also a potential, you know, to look at pulling all the revenue into an HDMI fund and then making availability payments. But this will depend on, you know, what the route is, what the traffic is, what the opportunities are, and what the response from the market is for us to be able. You know, so through this feedback and through the RFQ stage, we will be able to finalize the RFQ, but it is at the RFQ stage that you will find, uh, you know, the bidding criteria very clear. In terms of uh, you know the um, you know the procurement timeline, that's what it is on this particular stage. I think people would you know argue that this is a bit aggressive, but it's aggressive for a reason, because our country is in a hurry. We need investment. We need infrastructure. I mean, one sure way you know to fast track our recovery from COVID nineteen, it's investment in infrastructure. So you can see the timeline there for the OBC process, the issuance of the RFQ. The most time consuming part of this procurement process is the RFQ process, you know, which, are, which may require some bidders to do shadow studies and things like that, and also the RFP stage. So we would discuss with the market and show that as part of this engagement process, because that's a requirement of the national policy on public private partnership, stakeholder consultation and stakeholder feedback is extremely very important. That when those discussions are had, then you know, decisions are made on the timelines that are suitable to ensure that good quality bids are available. But the other thing to note is that many of these things are brownfield projects, you know, so it, it's, uh, it doesn't have the complexities and the huge requirements of greenfield projects. So that is uh, that. Now this also just uh, gives you, uh, you know, sort of a taste of what has happened. You know, the ministerial meeting has happened. The review of the proposal is happened. We're having the stakeholder engagement. After the stakeholder engagement, there was a focus group discussion you know, with various parties and finalizers. And like the minister has said, the way to respond to this proposal is not to call me on the phone. It is not to send proposals to the minister. It is for you to wait, you know, for the procurement notices and then respond to the procurement notices. That is what the law requires. And I recall, anytime I meet the president, what he always reminds me is that do what the law requires. So, you know, we don't want any miscreants. So people should realize that 
you know, wait for the, you can, you know, go onto our website, go to the ministry's website, you'll find information, but please, you know, get your SPDs ready, you know, get your teams ready, and then we will publicly announce and give people sufficient time, you know, to bid. This will be a transparent process. We don't know the outcome of this process, but I can assure you that as a regulator, what will happen is that we would only do what is best uh, for Nigeria. That, that's the end of the slides, and at this juncture, please permit me to, uh, you know, uh, unshare my screen and then hand over again uh, to, uh, you know, to my colleagues from the Federal Ministry of, uh, you know, Works. Thank you, Engineer Chidi. Um, that was quite inciting. I'm sure that the entire country or our stakeholders are really excited about what has happened today. This is the first of its kind, and I think if it is open and transparent, everybody will be given opportunity. And I think this is a great opportunity for Nigerians, um, including the SMEs, especially the aspect of the unbundled asset um, approvals. Thank you very yeah, much. Let, 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 me say, let, let me say one last point there. I mean, if you look at those 10 routes, I mean, the reason we could have taken more, but the 10 routes are taken very, very carefully. You know, they have the highest chance of success. And if you look at the presentation that was made by, uh, you know, by Femi, showing the level of detail in terms of investment grade traffic analysis and looking at the routes. I mean, look, you're looking at Benin, you're looking at Shagamu, Benin. You're looking at Owero on nature. I mean, these are economic corridors and the overall objective of this is to turn these routes, you know, to pontifliers and economic, that what you have in Malaysia, like what you have in South Africa, like what you have in anywhere in the world, that people can drive, go into restrooms, you know, feel very free and all that stuff. The objective is so that these highways become a critical way to power our economy. They are well maintained, they are lovely, and all the studies we have shown is that Nigerians are prepared to spend their money to pay a bid for very good uh, infrastructure. We've seen that with mobile phones, you know, uh, so we expect to see the same, you know, implosion of economic activities, the same implosion of wealth by having, you know, this road. Imagine a well-maintained road to Lagos where you can live on nature and be sure that you would get to Lagos in two hours. Imagine the same thing with the world on it. Imagine the same thing with Abuja Kaduna Kano. So this is what this is supposed to do. Around our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we'll pass it back on to Dr. Bongo for the interactive session. Bongo, are you still with us? Um, it, it does appear, you know, uh, Bonga is uh, is following us. So, uh, you know, with with uh, the permission of uh, the honourable ministers, uh, maybe what we'll do is is we'll take the first Q and A session, which is what we're supposed to do, and then uh, I think for me, I think you guys need to be there to take your own Q before we go to the panel. There's a Q and A. I mean, people might have. Uh, you know, uh, you know, questions to ask you. Uh, the Honorable Minister will be answering, sir. Pardon? Okay, Honorable Minister, I think uh, we're, we're going into the first set of uh, questions. I think Bonga is following up, so please permit me to uh, to do a human's job for him. Uh, Aku Kolo, are you still there? Are you? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I'm here. Are there any questions for the Honorable Minister? The Honorable Minister, let's take those questions in just a minute. Questions for the Federal Ministry of Works, and let's take those questions before we go into the panel. Okay. Maybe while you're getting ready, I mean, uh, there is a question I see. Hello, sir. Honorable Minister, the first question is from Chinedu A.K. Chuku. Most Nigerian roads are in bad shape. I reckon expensive clay soils is a great challenge. Do you carry out geological technical survey before road construction maintenance? Is this data readily available? Can they be shared?
Yeah, I want to say there's a question there which talks about uh, the quality of our roots being uh, that is actually the problem are caused by the soil conditions and whether we carry out a regular, you know, soil test and then, uh, you know, make sure that whatever we do in terms of construction and foundation, you know, uh, laying for the roads fits in with the, uh, you know, soil condition requirements for the road and it, can that information be shared? Well, um, what I would suggest, if you permit, is perhaps take a couple of questions instead and be more effective with management of time. So instead of one, maybe we take three or four. Okay, sir. So the next one is from Emeka Eze. This is, a, this is really disruptive development, but how do you deal with the issue of capacity of the intended consortium? This is particularly so when the initiative is new and not so many firms would have got the experience as may be required. On the whole, this is exciting. The next one is from Charles Modo. What is the role envisaged for FEMA in the packaging of this program and the era following the implementation of the program? Do we take one more, sir? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm sharing the questions, so you can also um, see, the, see the questions on the screen. Okay. okay. So, so the next one again. Please. Edgy or Morigay, why is federal government partnering with multinational oil and gas companies in building federal roads in the Niger Delta region? Okay. So let me start with the last one. Um, um, the business of uh, oil corporations is their business, explore oil under joint ventures, uh, manage oil platforms and so on. But that said, the federal government has also opened up another uh, window for partnerships with different types of uh, operators uh, in which the NLNG as a major oil and gas uh, cooperation is playing a role now on the Bodo Boni Bridge. So, and this is being done through the road uh, tax credit initiative. So, if there are any more oil and gas operators who feel inclined to participate in that scheme, or even this one that we are contemplating in partnership with other, other uh, players, bearing in mind that oil and gas companies have their core specialty, but the output of their production capacity will be affected by how it is easy or difficult to distribute through the mm -hmm. road network. So in a nutshell, nobody's closed out. In, in terms of what role for FEMA, uh, there will be a continuing role for FEMA. Bear in mind first that FEMA currently now serves as a uh, dedicated maintenance parastata for completed routes in Nigeria. So bear in mind also that I said in my opening that we have a network of 35,000 kilometers. And bear in mind also that we're just starting with 2,000 plus kilometers. Also recognize that we cannot toll every part of the network because tolling requires that there must be alternatives. So there will be a role for FEMA to continue to manage the untold and the on, 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 on uh, concession routes uh, and perhaps make FEMA much more able to do this job because it will optimize its limited resources to manage what really fits its budget. Um, let me recognize the, <laughs> the idea that this is disruptive. Yes, sometimes you need disruptive thinking and I'm glad to hear that you find it really exciting. As far as capacity and the experience of the bidders uh, will be, as you say, uh, look, listen, let's be positive first of all. Um, that is my own attitude to everything. If we don't try, we won't win. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. And um, as I said in my opening, we don't expect everybody to have the speciality in house. So you can have some speciality locally, you may have some speciality internationally, 
And that's why we expect that you form consortia so that when you are coming, you have the best in toll management, you have probably the best in gantries, you have a consortium with the best in uh, lane marking, you have the best in signaling and those kind of things. So, and all of this will be subject to some uh, scrutiny uh, by the ICRC during the qualification stage so that we want to start with as much of the best consortia as possible. So this is not a situation where we envisage that one person knows everything. Uh, but we want people to pull resources together and give us the consortia that offer us the, the best services. Yes, whether we do geotechnical studies, yes, we do. Really and truly, it would be foolhardy to invest money in any road uh, uh, without knowing what the underlying condition is. It's like throwing money away, really. So we have a department in, in, in charge of designs, in terms of geotechnics, and in terms of materials. And that is why you will see that on roads such as the Lagos Ibadro Expressway, for example, the Abuja Kanu Highway, for example, the Ninth Mile Road, Enugu Portacot, uh, we are using a type of bitumen now called a polymer modified bitumen. And this is as a result of research and test. But it's not just enough to have the quality of geotechnical material uh, and soil. But it's also important to know the traffic count. So all of the traffic data we shared in the presentation was undertaken by this ministry and all our staff. So the first traffic data count was done in 2007. That was revised again, updated in 2019. And so in another one and a half or two years, we will update that. This is now standard practice in the ministry. So it is the information about the traffic and also the quality of soil and all of that, that determines the design and the capacity so that you know what kind of traffic, what kind of vehicles you're expecting on a particular road. And you had uh, us also telling you about projections for 20 years. So we actually have an idea how that road is supposed to be in 20 years. So the data can be shared, certainly. And uh, if you request for it, we'll be too happy to share the data that we have with you. Thank you, sir. Can I take okay. three more? Uh, oh, yes, by all means, why not? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, again, from Emeka Eze, what financial support in terms of guarantee can the finance ministry provide to support this initiative? Um, in effect, is this going to be a viability gap funding? Uh, is there going to be viability gap funding provisions in case there are roads that will need to be supported for the private sector to be incentivized? The next one, Abdurrahman. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for the precise presentation. I would like to know how the masses, especially unemployed graduates, can key into this program and benefit. Then Godwin Atta, one of the major challenges in Nigeria is the loss of lives on the highways as a result of speeding vehicles. To curtail this, I learned the government previously considered implementing the installation and use of speed cameras, which, are, which, are, which also are revenue generating technologies. Is the government still focused on implementing the speed camera technology to save lives and generate revenue? And how can private partners bid to provide the service? Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, uh, every in, in my speech, uh, I said what we are seeking to do is not only to bring multidimensional resources together, but is also to bring skills and technology together. That's what the HDMI seeks to achieve. So every technology that helps to save life, whether it is speed cameras, whether it is speed governors and control, such as the one that FRSC introduced on trucks, everything will become useful. Because our primary purpose as a government is first the preservation of lives. So I don't even think that it is appropriate to discuss safety of lives with generating revenue. Uh, there's no choice here. 
if 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 you permit me to say so, the primary thing first is save life. So every technology that is available, and those things will also, in my view, go to evaluation of the technical uh, capacity and refinement of each bid when the bids are submitted. Is it just a road? Uh, is it just a road that offers technology to save lives? If I was in the assessing panel, if I saw that as an extra, it will induce me to think that this bid perhaps should score higher in terms of technical qualification than somebody that doesn't offer it. But again, as Chidi said, we don't know what the outcome of this will be. We expect that it will bring value to Nigeria, but we will see how innovative people are when they develop their bids. And so you can have uh, a Mercedes Benz with just bare bone seats and music. You can have it with uh, Wi-Fi enabled connectivity or, uh, and those will tell you which one you, you, you prefer. Um, how the masses will get work. I think that as the consortia settle down when the bids are finalized and uh, they start to operate, there will be opportunities for people to be employed. I am positive. I don't know how that will happen. I don't know who will win, but I am sure that as they win, we will also be interested, especially the regulator, who will also be interested to see how this impacts employment. Because these are all of the data we have to continuously share with the president, the uh, uh, Federal Executive Council, about the impact of anything that they have approved and the Ministry of Labor. So I am, I am sure that, as I said, these are exciting times ahead for, for, for people looking for work. And so everybody be prepared. Uh, the, tomorrow is certainly much more hopeful as, as, I, as I see. Well, about viability gap and funding support and guarantees. Again, uh, the Honorable Minister of Finance has indicated in a goodwill message that this is a, an initiative that her ministry embraces. We've also heard from the Ministry of Justice their support. So um, I, I, I think that we, it is reasonable to expect that every reasonable and commercially sensible support will, will come into play here. But again, before we start bidding, I think it is, it is negative, if, if you permit me to use that word, to start seeing viability gap without even already assessing the assets and all of that. I think we should see first that this is going to work. That would be my own attitude and that is my spirit with which I attend and I, I embrace things. See the glass as half full first and then we'll see what happens from there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, question and answer session. Uh, very engaging and very informative. Uh, dear participants, you will see that uh, this government is a very transparent one the Honorable Minister of Works is always very open to answer all questions and critics in a very open way. So he runs a very open gov uh, government, uh, and we appreciate him for that. So we will now be going into the second session of this webinar. Well, it, it, it's supposed to have started at uh, uh, 1.30, but nothing is lost. Um, and this session deals with the risk assessment and financing options uh, for this program. And to moderate the session is no one else than Engineer Chidi Izowa. Um, and then we have in the panel, on the panel, um, Mr. Chinua Azibike, the CEO of Infracredit, Tariye Baregesin, uh, the MD and Chief Investment Officer of Am Harris Infrastructure Fund Managers. We have uh, Bolaji Balogu, the Chief Investment Officer, Nigerian Infrastructure Debt Fund. We have Oscar Oyema, the MD Nigerian Stock Exchange, Bola Onadele Koko, the MD FMDQ, uh, Samaila Zubairo, the President and CEO, um, African Finance Corporation, Mr. Lushola Lawson, Head West Africa, Africa Infrastructure Investment Managers, Dr. Skubir Sandhu, the Chairman, National Highway Authority of India. Um, I don't know if he's here with us because uh, the last time he was here to confirm and uh, uh, last but not the least, we have Skumbuzo Makozoma, the MD CEO, South African National Roads Authority, SDC Limited.
I don't know if he's also with us, but I'm sure that um, uh, the panelists, the Nigerian panelists are all here with us. So I will hand over now to Engineer Izuwa to moderate the panel session on risk assessment and financing options. Engineer Izuwa, please. Yeah, Bongo, thank you very much. Uh, the, the panel is very intimidating. So if I, if I start to stammer, you know, please uh, help me out. You know, because it's very, uh, I mean, you've got trillion sorry, dollar I can't people. Help you. <laughs> you've got trillion dollar people like uh, Oscar, you know, and, you know, African infrastructure investment manager. So I, I'll try to sort of, uh, you know, manage myself. I, I also want to say that uh, Luke and Emeya, you know, represents the managing director of uh, Sanra. So we're very lucky to have him here. The structure of this panel will be in two parts. You know, we'll, we'll take opening statements first. You know, I mean, the panelists will give us their general idea about, you know, road infrastructure investments and, you know, what Nigeria needs to do, you know, you know in the context of the HDMI to attract uh, investment to the road sector. And, and what I would say is that HDMI is gender sensitive, you know, so permit me to, uh, you know, ask uh, Tarier, you know, to basically give our opening statement in terms of, you know, your thoughts about HDMI, you know, financing road infrastructure for three minutes. Tarier, please. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear thank you. you. Thank you, Engineer Chidi. Um, thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the Honorable Minister for Works and Housing, uh, Mr. Babati Fashila San, for this uh, crucial initiative, and to also thank the other executive ministers for their conveyance of support, all other protocols observed. Uh, by quick intro, um, I'd like to just a brief description of the ARM um, and Harris Infrastructure Fund Managers. Uh, we are a joint venture between ARM and Harris, a South African Infrastructure Fund. And we were founded on the legacy of ARM and Harris experience in development of the development and investments um, in various infrastructure projects such as the Lake Concession Company, Henry and Bedia Bridge in Abidjan, and as well IPP to mention a few. Uh, we were the first equity fund to be licensed by the SEC in Nigeria. Uh, we're equi equity provider, the ecosystem for, for infrastructure. We take green risk and construction risk for a commensurate equity return. We manage funds from the Nigerian pension funds as well as DFI such as the AFDB. Um, on your question with respect to our um, to, to reactions about uh, the initiative, it's a very welcome. And the question is really about bankability and what are the type of structures that we as investors would require to make it attractive. Um, there are several drivers of bankability. Um, clearly traffic volumes, the trolling arrangements, um, and of course, potential liquidity support and government guarantees which underpin revenue and really become the baseline of bankability and baseline return. Other value accretive aspects of the project, such as land value capture from services such as advertising, telecommunications, servicers, we very much see these as um, upside um, and really uh, contributing to the overall business that comprises the baseline revenue as well as ups revenue. Uh, when structuring uh, the project projects um, in the toll road space, um, it's important that we also consider that while we can reduce government spending via PPPs, we may not be able to completely eliminate the need for government financial support either on the construction side or um, different forms of liquidity support to be able to enable uh, financial participation. Um, so based on that, I, I would like to spend some uh, the last minute or so that I have um, sort of delving into the issue of revenue and um, liquidity support. I think we all understand that it is globally uh, quite difficult to toll projects um, or to toll roads, and one always has to deal with alternatives to dealing with the tolling of roads. Um, and there are other there are methods that this can be uh, that can be used. So, for example, shadow toll availability payments, as Dr. Chidi mentioned, or minimum traffic revenue guarantees. 
And as an investor, we are very interested um, um, in the first place to look at those drivers, but we also want to really see the liquidity that stands behind those potential payments because we don't actually want to be dealing with um, sort of the issues of budgetary support um, um, when it comes to the drivers of that liquidity support. Um, so with res so um, sustainable liquidity support uh, should be provided by more than just LCs. And, and I was happy to hear about the concept of a potential road fund uh, that could be supported by um, um, monies from other sources uh, that can then be used to augment the, um, the, the, the viability of the projects. Um, times it's not even just a case of vanity, but more of the risk um, of volatility with respect to traffic or ability to charge certain tolls. And the reality is some sort of liquidity support goes a very long way to mobilize um, long-term capital and to also mobilize um, equity into the space. Um, some examples of liquidity support are like a road fund. And, you know, in Cote d'Ivoire, the Henry Cohn and Didier Bridge Bridge were successful um, because they had a, a road fund that also That's provided the support. The, what was great about the, the, the road fund was that um, the, the, the levies and the collections are enacted into law. And there are also certain protections to prevent um, mingling um, into the sort of the treasury operations. But however it's implemented, there are some key themes that are very important to invest in when we're looking at liquidity support. And some of them are the dependence from the budgetary system, independence um, from um, the risk of commingling, transparency, and also, God, so again, something that can be quite useful with respect to governance is um, participation of users um, on board of the fund, for example. Uh, and these really strengthen the backstops to this baseline revenue, which is very critical to actually mobilizing long-term capital into um, in toll road infrastructure projects. We can't ignore the need for um, still a potential um, form of guarantee uh, from government, especially with respect to the like of termination payments, other forms, of really the, the long, more of the, the uh, worst case scenario planning. Um, you, we, we, I think no one here is in the business on calling sovereign guarantees. They're really made, um, they're really used more credit enhancements and first case um, recall outcomes, if you will. And in some ways, and, and also used to support um, um, sort of liquidity support and to give strength liquidity support. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we, it will be very difficult to completely eliminate the, the need for that type of support. But what we've tried to do in our projects um, is by having a suitable liquidity framework, we want to ensure that the risk of the crystallization of a sovereign guarantee is extremely low. And that's why investors care very much about the framework for the liquidity support, because we really do not want a guarantee to become the fundamental source of payment. We really are using it for worst case planning and most testing risk um, and reward versus actually looking or relying on it as a um, payment source. Um, just in closing on my comment, I mean, there has been talk about us trying to channel pension fund saving into these type of projects. And indeed, we have a potentially large um, source of capital. But, you know, institutional capital um, in the pension fund market really requires certain characteristics when they run these type of projects. They're looking for stability, certainty, and the proximity to a fixed income stream. While funds like ours that are equity, as well as project finance banks, can take on construction risk, we can even take on some element of traffic um, and volume risk. The reality is to channel pension fund capital, um, we need to mitigate this to a great extent. And this is where liquidity support systems can be used to create a form of a synthetic, um, stabilized revenue stream that can then be contemplated by institutional capital. And I think this is going to be very important when we do get past the bidding stage, given that I really represent the financial um, sort of investing side, in that these become pretty fundamental to reaching financial close 
and aggregating the capital at the various levels of the capital structure to basically start um, or construction or complete construction in this case and um, to ensure um, um, you know, ultimate uh, funding for the project. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, you know, Tari. I think I think very very well said about the requirement for an ecosystem. So HDMI is going to have an ecosystem that creates the attractiveness for the uh, financing. There was a very important point you raised about you know uh, you know sort of uh, you know bankable traffic, and I think maybe at the time Bolaji speaks he would. But but I also see a potential for suppressed traffic. You know, look at what happened with mobile phones. You know, uh, if you look at what the calculations were, there are lots of people who would, you know, rather travel, who would rather fly from Lagos to Enugu, who would rather drive if there was a good road. You know, so I think the point is that we also need to factor that, you know, the jump you would see in suppressed traffic, you know, when these roads are viable and functional. And frankly, somebody like me, I prefer to stop every one hour and eat an uh, issue or something like that when I'm traveling, like just having a boring... Uh, you know, flight from one, you know, airport, uh, you know, to the other. And I think so many other Nigerians. But let me, uh, you know, and I also appeal to the panelists, please, if you can stick to three minutes, I couldn't uh, stop Tari here for the gender rule we have. Um, I, I would ask Thank your you, indulgence sir. to... <laughs> I'll ask your indulgence to go down the continent, you know, to our friend, you know, Luke Anameya, you know, who is uh, the engineering executive, you know, for Sanral. You know, I mean, you know, Imagine economies around the world, Brazil, Malaysia, Turkey, South Africa, have used, you know, public-private partnerships and concessions extensively, you know, to develop their road network. I mean, you've talked about the wonderful thing about the N1, the N4, and, you know, the road network you have in South Africa. You know, Lou, what, what lessons can you share for us? You know, what must we do as part of the HDMI rollout, you know, for us to get, a, you know, maximum, uh, you know, investor interest? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, thanks, uh, Chairperson, for the opportunity once again. I think, as we've indicated previously, investors will be looking for the highest return at the lowest risk in terms of investment. And by implication, it implies that you as implementing agent or authority need to ensure that you have access to appropriate technical advisors and expertise to assist you with these very complex arrangements that you refer to as a PPP project. Uh, I mean, the typical concession contract in South Africa has about 3,000 pages uh, in such a concession arrangement. And what you need to make sure as the implementing authority is that you have expertise on your side to assist and guide you when you negotiate. And that will be both from a financial expertise in terms of the structuring of the financial model, legal expertise, very importantly, in terms of the legal framework, in terms of, and then technical to assist you with the risk transfer, what risks are going to be transferred. Because if you don't have that capability, these very experienced institutions that have been doing it in a lot of other places, I can give you a guarantee they're going to take you to the cleaners and you're not going to be left with a lot after that. So if you don't make sure that you properly access experience, expertise to assist you and guide you with structuring, especially seeing the very aggressive 45-week time frame you have, I can just tell you typically in South Africa, it took, took us up to three years to complete that full process from when you start the bidding, the adjudication, the best and final offers from the two remaining bidders to get to financial close. It's a three year process due to the complexity. So you have got a highly ambitious timeline. And in terms of that, that timeline, I will strongly advise that you make sure that you do have access to world-class advisors that has done this before to protect yourself as a country, as an implementing agent in these complex financial arrangements. The other thing that's very important is that, as alluded to, traffic is directly equal to an income. And the affordability of a project must not be lost out of sight. 
because you may be able to get private sector to implement something at a price that the public do not perceive to be affordable. And then you could have a major public backlash at the ballot box. And unfortunately, when that is the scenario and politics becomes involved in something that is contractual, technical, you do have a problem. Uh, so once again, I think you need to very much make sure that in terms of the proposed pricing levels, toll tariffs that are proposed, if it's like a toll plaza, that it is affordable to the public. To get it affordable, as indicated by the previous speaker, might require some investment or co-upfront investment from the implementing authority to make the toll tariffs affordable to the public, else you could end up with a major backlash at the ballot box uh, if the public is unhappy in terms of these new toll tariffs not being that affordable. So for now, that's all from my side. Well, look, I mean, you know, thank you very much. And you could say that again, trust in God, but lock your can. You know, I think it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's very, very, uh, instructed that, I mean, you know, we need to have the right quality of our advices and all that stuff. And I think, you know, when I saw you talk about public backlash, you know, I could see the How Tank Freeway project, you know, you know, coming, you know, back at your, at your mind. It, it, it's pretty very easy to get on the, on the wrong side of uh, the public, you know, with, uh, with, with these things, you know. And we also saw it uh, with Lekki, you know, when the road was built, you know, people would ask questions about, you know, what the value of the tools are to them. Well, I, I saw you shaking your head, and I think it's, 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 I want to come to you next. I mean, looking at the HDMI, you know, what Tariye said, you know, what Louis said, I mean, you know, what, what are the key things that, you know, we need to do to be able, because, I mean, we are, we are in a thinner situation. There's no alternative. You know, there isn't money in the treasury. We need to bring in private capital. You know, what are those most do things that we need to do to be able to have that happen successfully? If you can, you know, do that for three minutes, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Chidi. Firstly, um, to you um, and LBS for organizing this. Um, I, I, I'd actually like to do so without repeating a lot of what's been said by the other speakers. I think the first fundamental is to acknowledge the fact that, you know, we've, we've laid out an intent and we've laid out a very good plan. Um, but I think it's also important that we calm everybody down, that that plan is very much in its early stages, and that plan realistically is not deliverable, um, unfortunately, in the timelines you know, that we've talked about. And it's not deliverable primarily because um, that investment capital um, you know, behaves very, very rationally, and that investment capital is going to look for a certain set of factors um, which are not yet in place. Um, Luz mentioned, you know, a couple of the things that we need to be doing properly. The first is to recognize, um, and, and, and I'm going to try to take perhaps more of a, an, an ecosystem approach, is to recognize that on this call today, with the possible exception of probably the NSIA, you basically have everybody who's committed dollars um, to financing infrastructure in Nigeria over the last five years. So there is no one you know, else who is going to come and do this better than the group that you have here. But what you must recognize is that we all have a critical role to play in the development process. You know, the first is to recognize that infrastructure, the way that investors look at it, is three asset classes. There's development, infrastructure, which only a certain type of money can go into. There's operating infrastructure, um, which, you know, pension funds and all of those other pools of capital can participate in. And what you need to do is to create an effort where the entire ecosystem is working together Firstly, to build the appropriate mechanisms for doing this. The second element is to recognize that what we're doing in Nigeria today has been done extremely successfully in a number of other countries. 
and Tarie talks about, you know, Henry Conambedia Bridge, but I'd really like to look at countries like Colombia, Brazil, and Mexico, where road building using private capital has been done on an extensive basis and thousands of kilometers of roads have been delivered. And there are a couple of key principles. The first is that you must recognize that you're going to put, have to put these roads into corporatized type structures. And when you do that, then it also requires the government to be willing, you know, to some extent to let go. Not let go in terms of standardization, you know, not let go, you know, in terms of, you know, the regulation of the process, right? But investment capital is never going to finance, you know, something that they don't have control, you know, over design, value engineering, all of the other elements. If you've ever built an infrastructure asset um, and you've, you've paid for that infrastructure asset, then you also want to be very, very clear that the money is going to come back. Capital exists today. Um, and let's be very, very clear about that. Not just globally, but actually substantial capital exists domestically today to deliver this road building project. I would even say to you that we can be more ambitious, you know, around the number of roads that you want to do. But it's about creating the right set of principles. It's about creating that process that ensures that if you want private capital in it, then truly you're prepared to stand back and allow whether you like it or not. The superior procurement practices, right, in private sector, you know, potentially the superior design and engineering practices in private sector come in to deliver what we want to deliver. Does, you know, the ability to do this exist within this country in a quick time frame? Yes, it does, but the government will need advice. Almost certainly because if you do not put the same quality of advisors around you, Firstly, there will be an expectations mismanagement issue, even in negotiating concession contracts. And that quality of advice, right, is available across the world, but it's also available if you want to do this. I would say the first part of this PPP actually is that you need to get everyone in the financing ecosystem in this country into a room and we sit with the planners of this, and we come up with how do we design this structure and make it bankable. And if we can do that, what you do is you open up a tap for trillions of Naira of capital to come through. But that's probably the first critical step. It's not to do it in the way we've designed this thing. This is what it looks like. Um, you know, we're running a tender process. You will get some people who will tender for it, but the reality of it is you will not get enough competent people who will tender for it. And that immediately limits the orbit of capital that is available for the development of these. Everyone recognizes the criticality of roads infrastructure. Everyone recognizes, for example, that you cannot truly diversify an economy like this if you cannot build the roads that enable us to turn our agriculture, which is low value, into high value. Everyone recognizes that this is a country blessed with tremendous mineral blessings other than crude oil and gas. And you cannot bring all of those minerals to ports to be able to export them or to bring them to markets if we do not build and design this road infrastructure. If we do so successfully, you know, and I would say to you that of all the elements we have to deal with, power and transportation networks are probably the two key catalysts, you know, to changing the course of our country's economic history. If we recognize the incredible opportunity to have for us to build 
a collaborative process across the ecosystem, but where you have people who have committed capital sitting in the room and where we're willing to be open, you know, and listen, you know, and exchange thoughts on how this can truly work. I genuinely believe, Chidi, that that capital exists in very, very substantial pockets, not only in this country, but across the world and can be delivered very quickly. It's also important on the government side that we're all quite coordinated about this. And what do I mean by that? We're having this conversation today. There's a conversation, you know, or there's, you know, there are pronouncements, you know, that have also been made, you know, by the central bank, right, around what they would like to do around infrastructure. And we really need to have everybody just seated around the table. This is Nigeria's problem. You know, this is not a particular government agency's problem. And it's now quite fundamental really about, you know, the future, you know, of our economy. We have to create these sustainable platforms that are scalable for financing infrastructure and they are possible and possible quickly but it does require collaborative effort across the sector. It's going to require, you know, infra credit, ARM, Harith, AIIM, NSIA, AFC, ourselves at NIDF, the exchanges, everybody involved in this process, working with the government to deliver on this objective. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, thank you very much, Bolaji. Uh, I've been warned by the moderator, you know, to be a bit more brutal with my time management. So, uh, Oscar, you're going to be my first victim. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, you've got three minutes to share your overall, you know, thoughts about the HDMI. And I mean, you know, you, you, I mean, you know, uh, Bolaji has talked about this is not rocket science. It's been done in other parts of the world in similar circumstances. And I think one thing we learned you know, last week on Turkey is that both Turkey and Nigeria are sub-investment grade, but they've attracted tons of capital, both internally and externally. So what are the key elements, you know, with the HDMI program? How can we create that teamwork that enables it work, you know, in terms of an overview from you? Um, thank you very much. And uh, I was wondering ahead of time that you can't uh, hold me to any less time than the other partners. <laughs> um, uh, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I must thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in the discussions and truly congratulations on putting this together. I think it's really a great uh, initiative and I like the fact that you have, you're holding this consultation session to get additional feedback and input uh, to help you design a better product that can be successful. Um, I'm not going to repeat what people have said. Uh, they've made uh, very good points. So I'm just going to talk about once you've completed the design, uh, you've had uh, people like uh, Bolaji and Tari in, in the room um, gather things together. We at the exchange provide a platform uh, for listing and trading of securitized uh, products, right? So uh, today we have about 26 trillion Naira in market capitalization across fixed income, exchange traded funds, and equities. Um, and so capital markets do have a role to play in unlocking PPP frameworks uh, for uh, your HDMI uh, construct. Uh, and the potential for capital markets to help address infrastructure financing gaps generally is primarily determined by the domestic institutional investor base, uh, mainly the collective investment schemes, the pension funds, asset management firms, and insurance companies. Sovereign wealth funds and foreign portfolio investments also have a role to play. Uh, so if you think about our, our own pension fund industry, which is the largest uh, pool of institutional capital in Nigeria with asset uh, assets under management of about 10.5 uh, trillion Naira, less than 2% of that is actually directly invested in infrastructure. You know, so you have the infrastructure fund and Sukuk. Um, you know, if you looked at other types of bonds, federal government bills and uh, green and conventional bonds, over 64% is allocated to that. So there's significant scope for uh, allocation of more capital 
uh, to your uh, road uh, financing needs, your infrastructure needs. And the number you've thrown out, 160 billion, uh, like Bolaji rightly noted, is actually not uh, that ambitious. Uh, the federal government just did a cook of 150 billion, and it was oversubscribed. So the money is there. If the um, projects are properly structured, uh, you will get that financing. What we provide is an additional layer from a listing perspective of cre credibility, transparency, and corporate governance. So they need to be corporatized, but those corporates need to work in such a way that people that are investing in these products uh, know that uh, they're investing in a very safe uh, way. Again, that risk reward uh, balance. From a secondary market perspective, uh, provides an opportunity for investors to get um, liquidity uh, when, if they need it. But the great thing about what you're doing is the time. I like the fact that it's 20 years. And really, one of the things that uh, pension funds have complained about is that they don't have appropriate duration hedge in terms of matching the investment horizon uh, with the investment opportunity. So this is um, a very commendable. Um, at the Nigerian Stock Exchange, and indeed uh, in the public capital markets, uh, we help in the creation and listing of instruments such as listed equity, closed-end funds, open-ended funds, listed project bonds, infrastructure funds, debt funds, Sukuk, exchange-traded funds, green bonds, etc. So there are many constructs that we can provide uh, to help in financing the SPV, depending on the kind of underlying uh, products uh, that, that uh, you have. And there are new things that are coming up, you know, securitization of, bond, of uh, bank loans. Uh, this is also a, can be available uh, in the capital markets. Um, we are currently even uh, creating a framework for the listing and trading of securities from the road infrastructure tax credit scheme. Uh, this will provide us it and liquidity opportunities for tax credit note holders. Um, you know, so, the, so there's just so many opportunities. I think I want to wrap up uh, by saying that the number of the points that have been made around the risking, uh, it, it's not even enough sometimes to uh, just rely on the sovereign. So it's very important that your multilateral uh, partners uh, also participate and even provide cross um, uh, the, ris the risking uh, elements to it because it makes it even more robust when you have not only your domestic investors participating, uh, but foreign uh, investors also participating and everything uh, in Naira. Uh, so I will wrap up by saying that um, we're here to support and to partner and to work with everybody along the value chain, the financing value chain, uh, to deliver something that is exciting to investors and that makes uh, sense. And uh, we will be very uh, much uh, uh, happy to, to do that with you guys. Thank you. Well, I mean, th thank you very much, uh, Oscar. I'm sure the Honorable Minister of Works and uh, my colleagues in the Works Ministry are extremely excited, you know, that money is in the problem, you know. So I think it's... Uh, it's, it's the issue is, is the work that needs to be done, you know, to be able to, um, you know, to do that. Also, I think, you know, at the time we go back to the minister, I think he would also say something about, uh, you know, I mean, you know, this comment about, you know, you know, seeing that the size is not ambitious and that we could actually become, uh, you know, more ambitious. That's something we can also take. But I think we also, uh, you know, need to realize that Rome wasn't built in a day. And I think it's one step at a time, you know, to just make sure that we can succeed and then build on that success. You know, Chino, I'll come to you, you know, next, you know, to give us your overview. I mean, what do we need to do, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, I mean, because if, if, if HDMI is a success we expect it to be, you know, the potential for our country is, is I mean, just, uh, you know, myself and, uh, and Bolaji will share this dream that we see in Nigeria, that people will drive from, you know, Sokoto to the beach in, uh, in, uh, in Lagos to enjoy themselves and go back, you know, the same day. It's doable, you know. So, what do we need to do to make the HDMI software? You're, 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 you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chidi. Um, and thank you, um, LBS and uh, Federal Ministry of Work. I'm pleased to be in this um, session. 
Um, it's impressive to see the effort that has been made so far. Um, and um, I wouldn't want to repeat what the earlier panelists have said, but I'll just start with a, with a brief introduction on, on, on InfraCredit. We were established in, in 2017 um, by the Nigerian Super Investment Authority in collaboration with other DFIs, um, Garanko of the Private Infrastructure Development Group, um, Africa Finance Corporation, the KFW Development Bank, um, and our mandate was to basically help promote long-term local currency financing for infrastructure in Nigeria, promoting financing from the local pension funds and other long-term investors using our guarantees as a credit enhancement. We have a AAA local currency rating, um, and you know we've supported a couple of projects to date, and I'll talk about that um, you know, as we go further. What I, where I wanted to start with um, was essentially to talk about the fact that, um, and Chidi, you have alluded to this before, um, that since 20, 2005 to 2006, um, one of the success stories I think we can look at, or at least a learning point, is, is the 29 port terminals that have been put into concession um, in 2000, 2005. We have had a history of um, concessions being successfully executed and have actually come to a second round of, of review. Um, and the, ex the examples of private sector investments that were made in this in these um, in the port sector, right? Um, over, over half a billion dollars um, estimated um, as of 2017 has been invested into this sector. And we've seen um, between you know, 10 to 15 years of, of evolution of, of concessions successfully executed in the country. And um, the likes of AP Mola, Maersk, PTML, Cyfax, local and both international. So we do have a history of, of, of being able to conduct um, you know, successful PPPs that involve concession and this was done by the by government, right? Um, so what has what has changed, um, and, and what are the lessons learned? Um, some of the lessons learned um, were the tenor, right? Um, some of the feedback we got were that there should have been a longer tenor, and then some of the concessions were FX linked, and um, and these cons this affected the ability of some of the concessionaires to invest in long term assets because they were looking at the concession period, and some of them had to renew the period. So there are lessons learned in the sense that, and at that time, there were several constraints we had. Um, and this is 2005, 2006. Now, over time, what has happened, right? In 2004, um, just about the time those concessions were issued, there was the Pension Reform Act. And between then and today, our domestic debt capital markets um, pool of local capital has evolved from about 48 billion as of 2004 to about 10 trillion today in local currency. So we didn't have a pool of long-term local currency finance at the time, but we still did a concession successfully in 2005, 2006 under those adverse conditions. So today we've had some, some, some positives and you know, sitting around this panel are institutions that have evolved over that two decade period to date. Um, and at the same time, I mean, I'll talk from our experiences over the past two and a half years of our existence, we have created a new asset class with our guarantees. Um, before InfraCredit, corporate, long-term corporate debt for infrastructure wasn't available, right? And we to promote domestic credit from local pension funds to finance infrastructure um, going into private sector institutions um, in the form of long-term corporate debt securities. And we've extended that tenor to up to 15 years. So unprecedented again, even within the African um, markets, that companies are borrowing 15 year financing in fixed rate borrowing from local pension funds in Nigeria. So we have evolved in terms of success stories. And I think looking at where we're coming from and the successes we've had, I think what, would, what the next question we'll be asking ourselves is, what do we need to go forward? Now, you've always said, you know, and I listen to you a lot, uh, Chilis, I take one or two of your, um, you know, your words of wisdom, that political will, you know, the bureaucracy is about lack of political will, right? Um, and then a lot of the challenges we have around concerns around bureaucracy has always been about political will. You, you crack a joke about uh, if a politician wants to build a house, if it's a, a, a bridge in his village, he'll, bring, he'll build it quick if, if, if he's incentivized to do it. In the same way, we feel that if, if the government is very, very committed to doing something, it can get it done within reasonable time, as long as all the necessary um, stakeholders are aligned towards achieving that objective. So 
I think what we've seen so far is a commitment um, to come up with locally, um, you know, generated ideas. Um, and I think it's worth, you know, um, acknowledging that some effort has been put in to try and develop a solution um, that can now be considered further. Um, and, and I think to Bolaji's comment, I, I do agree that a, you know, a stakeholder, an engagement, which is, this is a first step towards some form of engagement with the stakeholders and, and I, I, I and um, Tari's points on, on liquidity and um, risk sharing is very apt. I wouldn't repeat what she said because she's really touched around most of the key issues that institutional investors would want to see and um, to attract interest into, um, into this sort of asset class. And so we do have, um, we do have you know, ideas of, of innovative structures. Um, we do have a locally designed proposal which can be refined when necessary and adapted to achieve our, our objective. We have domestic resources in, in the form of funding that can support these, um, these assets. And importantly, is across the life cycle for infrastructure finance, we have the different institutions that have different capital mobilized to finance from development to construction to operations. So we can support long-term financing for operating assets. Um, the ARM can support you know, um, early stage financing. You have the NIDF, NIDF that can also provide financing across the value chain. And you have the, um, you know, um, the, the AIM as well, the African Infrastructure Investment Fund. So you have across the capital like this life cycle, you do have instruments that didn't exist in 2005 when ports were concessioned successfully. So therefore, I think we have made significant progress. And I think the challenge we probably need to address is you know, that political will element. Because from the conversations we've had so far, we have heard from different ministers speak um, you know, supportively of, of, of this initiative, even from the Ministry of Justice. And so I think we do have, and then we also have, you know, um, commitment to implement. I think being able to now bring to the table and in an open way, um, sit with government to, to address the concerns that private sector would want to see um, tackled through this process. Uh, and more importantly, ensuring that the development phase is, 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 well, you know, is, is, is well put together with the right parties around the table. We do have a, a strong chance of success um, to the extent that these these variables are addressed as we as we progress through um, through this um, through this um, project. So, we're you know very much um, you know supportive of this, and and to whatever extent that um, we all have a role to play in ensuring that the collective objective really is to create jobs, and promote local economic growth, um, and and also reduce poverty. And, and and I think we're all very aligned on whatever it takes for us to collectively achieve that objective. Then we work, um, you know, together, and I believe even for the for the pension fund community themselves, the, their contributors are also going to benefit from the sustainable of these roads. Um, and, and 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 we know all know the um, socioeconomic benefits of having good roads, and we talked about that, um, you know, in, in, you know, already in this in this session. So I think we do have those ingredients. I think that's what's important. The ingredients are there. Um, so we don't necessarily need, and the local solutions do exist. The capacity exists. And it appears the commitment is there. Um, you know, the, the, the pudding, the, you know, the proof is in the pudding. And as we progress further, I think it's now being able to coordinate ourselves going forward towards a, a collective goal that we can all identify, what is shared success. I think when we identify what success is and how that can be shared, and then we're, we're all aligned with a vision and we can approach this, um, this initiative with a collective, um, you know, um, mission towards, towards a successful outcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I think it's going to be unlikely I would have the opportunity for a second round of questions, you know, because uh, from a time perspective, I would, I, would, I would await your guidance. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change a bit of my style and start to put things together. So even if we don't have a second chance, you know, we can uh, achieve our overall objective. Chidi. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, please permit me. I don't know if this is an appropriate point for me to weigh in. Yes, you can. Okay, so... Um, I'd like to thank all of the, all of the uh, participants. I unfortunately uh, missed Tari's intervention, but I think I got a hint of it from uh, Chinua's summing up. And, and, and let me first say that what we are doing today is the second step we have taken. Let me make that clear. It's a step of consultation. So we are not at the stage of take it or leave it. 
So if it appears that way, clearly there is no such intention. So the first step we took was to consult with the leadership of the Works Committee of the National Assembly, because we knew that parliamentary oversight was crucial to success. The next step was to ask ministers to join us. And you heard their endorsements today. So these are important steps in all the bankability, the risking, and all of that that we talk about. Because it takes one policy to create a bureaucratic hurdle. And those are the things we are first trying to eliminate. So if we didn't think that your views were important, we wouldn't be talking to you. And I say that in context to some of the things that my Bolaji Balogun has said, which I will try to address. First of all, the idea that there's some superior engineering or procurement capacity in the private sector. It's a very debatable view. GD and I and many of us come from the private sector. So we are now here in government. So the private sector is in government. The vice president is from private sector. All of us are here now. So there is no superior capacity anywhere. The important thing is that we must work together. Now, more important, and we recognize that if we open doors by policy statements, then the private sector will drive it. You are 90% or more of the, of the entire ecosystem. But we are the 1% or less who determine by law or policy what you do or what you can do. And we recognize that. But with respect, I would like to have the debate privately with Bolaji about whether superiority exists. But you see, the next thing I hear is that, OK, it's too small, 160 billion. I think that Oscar has made the point. The most important investor first is the local investor. So we know 160 billion is a very small part of it. But our sense is that if we are going to make a mistake, let us make a small mistake. A small mistake over a small 6%. And if we are going to succeed, it means that we will go on from doing small things to do very big things. And I think it's important to note that point. Then, well, Bolaji thinks that this procurement thing is too quick, is too fast, and all of that. The question, as Chinua has asked again, is really and truly, we have moved all of the bureaucracy now. And is it a problem we are moving too fast? So where is the halfway house here? So Bolaji, just run with us if you think we're too fast. <laughs> so there must be a halfway house somewhere. So everybody, these steps we are taking ordinarily will take two years. Trust me. And we're crashing it into less than a year. And with a size of 160 billion, then it can't be that difficult. When we get to the super highways, then we will see the mistakes that we have made. We will correct them. They will not be too large. They will not be too irredeemable. And I say this um, with respect. Then um, I just think the last point I wanted to make, uh, I've talked about size, I've talked about speed, is the local capacity. And in engineering, the much I know of it is that there are global standards. They are minima and they are maxima. So nobody can invent his own engineering standards. It's a global standard. You're either playing within those parameters or you're not doing engineering. Now, everybody has talked about one road built anywhere, another one, all examples from around the world. I want to talk about the Nigerian story. And that's why I have said this is a locally developed initiative. And perhaps in the next five years or 10 years, somebody will write this story and say, this was a holy Nigerian story and if you want to find out the people who did it, go and call Balogun, go and call Oscar Yema, go and call Chidi, and go and call Ch uh, Femi Akele, Re, go and call uh, Aliu Abubakar, the Minister of uh, State for Works and Housing, and all the directors. That must be our story. And that's why we want to project this as a Nigerian initiative that worked. And we know that these are baby steps, but we want to grow up before we develop a moustache. Thank you. Yeah, Honorable Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't meet my late father, but my late father used to tell me that show me passion and I will show you success. I mean, the passion I see in your voice, the passion I see in Bolaji's voice, the passion I see in everybody's voice tells me that HDMI is a success. 
and that what we're doing here today is it's, it's oiling the will of the success. So I think, you know, Nigeria is a big winner here. Uh, you know, the, 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 and, and like I said, uh, Mr. Moderator, I'm not sure whether I'm going to have a second round. So please permit me to sort of take a bit of uh, a pivot here. I want to come to Amadu. The reason why I want to come to Amadu is that, you know, Amadu works for the African Finance Corporation. So he's representing Sumaila Zubairu, you know, the CEO. AFC, you know, is invested millions of dollars in the Bakwena Toll Road, you know, in, a, in, in, in South Africa. And I think we've talked a lot about lenders here, you know, who are putting capital. But I think in between them are the sponsors, you know, the actual, you know, SPVs who will do this project. You know, so what I want to ask, you know, Amadou is this, look, you know, what, what were the critical factors you saw, you know, that made you invest in Bakwena? And how do you see that as, as some sort of, you know, help, you know, particularly with HDMI and also put in the issue of, you know, sponsors? You know, because we talked about this RFP process, because you need confidence in the consortium who would do this, that they would deliver it, you know, for the lenders, you know, to have the confidence, you know, to put their money on the table. Thank you, Chidi. Uh, good afternoon, honorable ministers and uh, distinguished panelists. Um, I want to present the apologies of Samaila. Uh, he was supposed to be here, but uh, we have a scheduled board meeting, so unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Um, just before I get into your question, uh, Chidi, I think um, uh, the gentleman from South Africa made the point that um, most countries are going to prioritize infrastructure development to spur the rebound of their economies post-COVID. Um, this means that Nigeria will definitely be competing for um, uh, investment resources. Um, but I'll go a bit further. Um, uh, the, 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 the criteria that the gentleman from South Africa stated was around uh, superior returns and lower risk. But I think the, import, the other important aspect is around the state of preparedness of some of these projects and to have a streamlined procurement process in order for, uh, for those projects to be uh, shovel ready. Um, I think if you look at Nigeria, the, the, it has one of it has a very, very good uh, road connectivity, but I think the challenge is the condition, and it's likely due to lack of maintenance. And I'm glad that um, uh, this, 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 this problem is recognized, and I think this HDMI program uh, is to a large extent um, uh, geared towards um, uh, addressing that, um, uh, that challenge that the country is facing. Um, in terms of uh, experiences with Bakwena, I think it was more around the structure. Uh, some of the bankability issues have been addressed by um, uh, previous speakers, so I will not touch on that. But I would want to take off my, um, uh, my banker's hat and just put on my engineer's hat. And um, uh, this is experience um, uh, from representing AFC on the board of uh, some of these um, uh, to, uh, concession, the road concession companies across Africa. I think uh, one important aspect that um, uh, uh, Nigeria needs to take in mind in the uh, evaluation of um, uh, proposals is the issue of uh, the consortia must have a proper pavement management system. Um, there's a there's a strong need to keep track of you know how many uh, vehicles ply uh, ply a particular road, what is their um, uh, axle load because that is what determines the frequency at which you need to undertake your maintenance. So if you get those numbers wrong, it could lead to uh, rapid deterioration of your pavements. And instead of doing actual maintenance, you'll be doing reconstruction, which is significantly more expensive. So I think there has to be the awareness that um, um, uh, there has to be a proper pavement uh, management system. And this is what is uh, prevalent in South Africa, and it is what is helping to um, uh, maintain their roads to an acceptable condition. But related to that is the issue of absolute um, um, uh, monitoring and uh, enforcement. I think most of the damage to our roads is likely due to um, uh, lack of en um, uh, enforcement of um, uh, axle loads. And um, what they do in South Africa is more around um, uh, 
empowering the concessionaires to enforce within their the, the concession areas the issue of um, uh, load control. And um, uh, if, 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 if uh, vehicles are over, overloaded, there is the possibility that um, uh, they will be forced to um, offload some. And, and I was very happy that the Honorable Minister, in his uh, opening remarks, made mention of warehousing for offloading um, uh, some of the goods on uh, some of the trucks that are plying on this road. So I think, I think the government is in the right direction in uh, transforming the, um, uh, the sector. But where I think we need to do a bit more, given the need to really streamline the procurement process, is that there are important lessons to be learned from some of these countries that have implemented um, uh, similar, similar initiatives. Uh, I agree with the fact that, yes, it should be um, uh, a homegrown solution, which is what the government has done. But I think in order to avoid the, um, uh, the pitfalls that um, uh, maybe other countries have already gone through, it would be useful to you know, tap resources uh, from uh, some of those countries that have basically implemented something similar, but uh, to a much larger scale and use that as template to at least uh, kickstart this pilot scheme that the country is um, uh, planning to embark upon. Um, on the part of AFC, um, uh, we are very, very glad to share experiences in uh, the various concessions that we've uh, invested across the continent. And we are willing to, um, uh, and, and, and we have the mandate to provide capital across the entire value chain with uh, project preparation, um, uh, main investment, uh, both debt and um, uh, equity as well. So I'll stop there because of um, uh, recognition of time constraints, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, okay. I mean, thank you very much, Amadou. Shola, I'll come to you. I understand that over-the-counter trading is a short process. So, uh, you know, so because of that short, the shortness of the process, I also know that you will be very, uh, you know, very brief with your, with your comment. You know, you're more interested in the amount of money you put on the counter, you know, than what you would say. So uh, it, it, it's over to you, Shola. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Chidi. I think firstly, I think this is an excellent initiative and uh, good afternoon to, to the Honourable Minister and also kudos to LBS and to, to the entire organising committee. Let me just start by quickly introducing AIM for those, those of you who don't know us. Um, AIM is a subsidiary of Old Mutual. Um, today we manage about $2 billion focused on infrastructure, equity investing across the continent. And um, when you talk about toll roads, that really is part of our DNA and part of our fabric. 20 years ago, we were involved in the first um, three toll road concessions in South Africa, um, Bakwena, Track, and, uh, and N3TC. And also we, we were involved together with ARM on the, uh, on the um, Leke Epe project. If you, if you look at toll roads, uh, road PPP concessions in Africa, there actually haven't been that many that have been successful. They've, they've actually only been six. Um, three, in, three in SA, one in Nigeria, one in Ivory Coast, and one in Senegal. So it's not a, a, uh, a, the easiest thing to do. And I think if you look at the programs which have been successful, um, I'm picking up from a lot of the things that have been said earlier, but, but the key one that comes to mind is the implementing authority and setting up the project, the, the program in a way that can crowd in financing. And I'll use the example of, of the renewable energy procurement process in South Africa, which um, was a consistent set of documentation, which allowed that program to scale from a quite a very small initial round to a $14 billion program, um, which has occurred over 10 years. So putting in place the structure, the risk allocation, and the documentation, even though you want to start small, but that allows you to infinitely scale and, and to crowd in not just local investors, but also other international investors, I think is going to be quite important um, uh, as a cornerstone to the program. The other thing I would say is that the, um, the, the crowding in local capital markets, as Chinua mentioned, some of the things that they're doing, um, 
Bolaji through his, his debt fund, ARM as well, I think is, is, is going to be critical because that is effectively the pool of capital that is best matched to long-term um, high capital assets, which are index linked, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we need to think about how best to do that. Uh, and they need to be part of the conversation as well as, uh, 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 you know, the equity sponsors on this side and, uh, and the debt sponsors as well. I think what we like about what we've heard is the fact that the roads are brownfield, that they're in key economic corridors, and they're not necessarily urban tolling projects where you can run into um, certain stakeholder issues. I think on the revenue sharing aspect, there'll be a degree of flexibility as to what um, investors can take, but I don't think investors are going to be demanding full availability payments. Um, so there's some um, sharing that's, that's possible there. You know, if traffic goes above a certain level, you can pass that through in, in lower tariffs, et cetera. So I think there'll be, there'll be something here about the commercial structure. We like the fact that the put call option agreement has been, has been mooted. That is, a, that is a, a, a guarantee structure that has worked, um, particularly for us in the, in the power sector with, uh, with the project that, that we've been involved in. So I think the elements are here. It looks like the political will is also here. Um, the, 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 the financing parties are around the table. Capital markets are ready to go. And it's a question of setting up the program such that you, in a way that you can scale it um, properly. Uh, that will be the core foundation as to whether, whether this is a success. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shola. When you say that, you know, toll roads are hard, you know, you remind me of my middle name, which is Kennedy. Uh, and I recall, you know, John F. Kennedy saying that, you know, we, we choose to go to the moon because it's hard. You know, we, we choose to do this not because it's easy, it, but it's something that is extremely very essential, you know, for us, uh, you know, to develop our country. And, and like we've talked about political will, five ministers in one place, you know, speaking in one unison, you know, the, uh, you know the, 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 the attorney general talking specifically about a dispute court, you know, focused on these things. I mean, that shows you that, you know, PO Box 1 is taken care of. You know, it's time to push our country forward. And I, I you know, I, the, the, we, we would have to do this. And uh, at this juncture, permit me to, uh, you know, go to the main over-the-counter trader, you know, who, because of his uh, skills, would even be uh, shorter than all of us. But, but thanks for keeping yours uh, fairly very brief. Coco. And I want to come to you and, uh, you know, take a bit of your insights on, uh, you know, what we need to do, you know, to make this a success. After your speech, I would have to sort of uh, see what leeway the moderator gives me because uh, we're tight on time and then we can act according to uh, as we are guided by the moderator. Thank you, Chidi. And, um, uh, good afternoon, Honorable Minister. Um, I I'm going to uh, start from the debate that is already ensuing between uh, the Honorable Minister, um, of course, we expect him to enjoy debates, and Bola Um <laughs> one, one, one point he made is that even if the private sector is 99%, um, government is 1%, and that 1% decides what will happen. And that is acknowledged, and, and we're lucky today that we have people from the private sector who are now in government. Honorable Minister and Chidi, you're doing a great work. Thank you very much for, for what you're doing. And we should not uh, 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 underestimate what you, are, what you are about to achieve and what you're doing. Um, however, I'd like to us to speak to capital. So I, I'm going to look at four boxes very quickly. The first one is the philosophy of the country, and I think that conversation is already pervasive. I've been hearing bankable, bankable. Um, an honorable minister, what you've been able to do to, 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 be, to sort of get government behind this agenda is great. And uh, as I said, um, it's not an easy task. However, we should make sure we get things codified. So when you leave office and others are there, uh, for Femi or anybody to be able to write the story, what we want is not a personal story, but a national story. So things have to be codified. Uh, I encourage you to continue with what you're doing so this gets codified. The next is vision, um, which comes under leadership. And again, that has been seen. I'd like to speak to strategy, which is where you have that capital. 
Um, 160 billion, whether it's big or small, we know that what Nigeria needs is in trillions. So the strategy has to be right. And that strategy, unfortunately, um, is going to unlock what is on the 99%. And if that 99%, the capital is not at the table very quickly to sort of have a big voice, and the minister already said that is being done with this, as to what is required and what is needed, that capital will not come. I'm going to throw some figures uh, so as to take the conversation Oscar started, the exchanges, what we do, all those things Oscar already mentioned. Uh, and Bolaji spoke to the stage where it is development, which is construction, we know there's no security. When it starts going into securitization stage, when these projects, and you must make sure these projects can transit from that development to operating. That is where the exchanges and capital market comes in. I'm going to give you some figures. 1986 exchange rate was three. Uh, 1991, it was nine. 1993, 18. Two, 1995, 85. 1999, 100. We entered three digits. 2015, 150. 2016, 300. 2017, 360. 2020, 400. If I take two year buckets between 1986 and 2005, exchange rate moved from three to 130. From 30 year bucket of 1999 to 2030, exchange rate 100 to where? We have to look at capital seriously and start dimensioning the strategy to attract capital. And I'll put that in two boxes again, domestic and foreign. Domestic, we shouldn't take it for granted. Pension funds, we want the money. These are people's money. Inflation is at 12, inflation is at 13. Where is this money being invested? We must ensure that the projects that will attract the pension fund, if we're not careful, the pension funds may even stop at some point if contributors challenge what we're doing. And we have to quickly, and that's the and that probably speaks to what the minister said about coordination. It is not just for us in infrastructure alone to say we want to build it. We have to bring the finance part to it to say pension is where the money is going to come from. Pension cannot end and be invested below inflation. So on that domestic side, we need to quickly at, at, at start getting coordinated in getting that capital and government policies and agenda together. And then if if for any reason we let the inflation eat into that pension too much, people will start thinking of dollarizing. Then we start losing the capital. Now, capital, I keep saying it, is very mobile. But yesterday I decided to add is not asleep at all. So it's a 24-7 capital. We have to do as much as we can to keep the capital in this country. The 10 trillion, 20, 12 trillion of Pension funds are great, but we have to ensure that this, this, this is growing to be able to fund this agenda we're starting. The second part is the foreign capital. The truth is we're going to need foreign capital. Uh, as you said, uh, Chidi, this is starting with 160, but I know your ambition is beyond 160 billion. With the foreign capital, we have to start thinking of how this sort of foreign exchange we have, and I'm talking of from 1980s, 90s, 2000s, we have to arrest it at some point. If someone is bringing $5 billion to Nigeria to support our agenda, it shouldn't be thinking of foreign exchange risk at all. We have to be able to de-risk that foreign exchange risk. And that is where exchanges like FMDQ come in for us to design products where they can have cross-currency swaps, which are cleared on the exchange. They bring the dollars into Nigeria. We give them Naira 30 years time the investor comes for his dollars, so he's not thinking of exchange rate risk at all. He looks at the projects we have, he looks at the infrastructure, and he sees that this is bankable project. Because if, I, if you look at the numbers I just gave, whatever project you did, whatever, whether it's bankable or not, if someone came into this country in 1986, dollar was three to one, and 30 years after, it was 300, there's no return that will have taken care of such things. And we have to look at this as we think 
about everything we're doing. I think this is laudable, but we must look at how all the stakeholders, all the touch points, Honorable Minister, are well taken care of. And I, and I believe strongly in your sagacity to be able to get everybody around, the, around all the touch points around for us to have a codified, coordinated agenda as to funding infrastructure in this country. I believe what you're doing is going to be the start, is the foundation, but I think years later, you're going to sit back, enjoy yourself, and enjoy your time with your grandchildren and see the numbers that this idea you started today would have delivered to this country. I wish you well. The 99 side of Bolaji Balogun and the capital they bring will get them to the table to listen to them, but I think that is the future. Minister, I look forward to the debate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Koko. Uh, th 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 that's very great to you. And I can assure you that His Excellency, you know, BRF, understands what you talked about, capital, that the biggest coward on earth is capital. And capital will never go where it is threatened. You know, the Honorable Minister has got a wonderful smile on his face. Don't mind that he's part of the Bowtie Mafia. But he's smiling to attract capital to HDMI. So he recognizes the cowardice of capital. He also recognizes the fungibility of capital. So all those critical elements about capital are well understood. And this program, I can assure you, will be structured in the line to be very attractive, like honey goes with bees. At this juncture, I think, you know, uh, we, we, we are going to start this at 310. So I, I want to appeal to the moderator that, you know, hand over to him because we're not going to be able to go through a second round so that, uh, you know, we can keep to our promise to the Nigerian people, uh, if that's okay with all the panelists. My deepest apologies to you, because I think we can continue this till tomorrow. I see the energy in the room and I say the light. And, and thank you very much, everybody, for taking out the time here to stand up for our country. I truly believe that every generation must out of relative obscurity, discover her mission, fulfill or betray. This is the infrastructure generation. And we will, we can, and we must deliver a better Nigeria. Bongo, over to you. Thank you very much, Injena Izuwa. Um, I think all the, all the issues about financing and the rates uh, seem to have been very well covered by that distinguished panel conversation. Um, at this juncture, uh, we've exceeded the time, and I need to apologize to you. It's just necessary that we have to um, you know, listen to the conversation from the leaders uh, across the financing value chain of infrastructure. That is very important because the conversation today will not be complete if we didn't hear from them. So please uh, accept our, our heartfelt apologies. Um, at this juncture, we will no longer be able to take the second round of uh, questions, but I assure you that all the questions that you've asked, as long as we have your email addresses, we will um, address them uh, and communicate with you um, uh, later on. Uh, so I would like to uh, hand over to the uh, Honorable Minister of Works. I think he will have some responses. He did some intervention uh, while the panel discussion was ongoing, but I think uh, he needs to respond to some of the issues uh, before we bring this uh, webinar to an end. Well, thank you, Bongo. Uh, I, I seriously doubt that there is any response now that I can make today that takes care of the, all the issues. This is a continuing conversation, a continuing engagement, and uh, I am sure as we go on, we will cover all the distance that needs to be covered, except to say very big thank you to all of the participants and to, to you, LBS, to Chidi, to my brother, Hadi Sirika, Koko, Oscar, everybody, uh, who, Bolaji, everybody who has participated here. I, I, we truly do not take your time for granted. And we believe that it is time very well worth investing in a vision for tomorrow that I believe is truly exciting. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency. Now, Injina Izuwa, um, you, you have uh, music to play, and then I think I'll leave you to conclude, and then we'll, we'll close. Yeah, I, I just want to share my, my, my screen, and if people you know, believe what they see on the screen, I, I just want them to sort of uh, you know, raise their hands. I, 
are, are you hearing me? Yes, we are. We are hearing you, and we can see your screen. Are you hearing the video? Uh, we, I can hear the audio. I don't know if other people can, but we see the video. We see the, um, yeah. Check the voice. Chidi. Chidi. Yes, please. This ain't no stopping us now. Something from your old disco days, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Balaji? Yeah, my point is it's, it's, yes. I saw the Honorable Minister recognize the LP of, of, of this. <laughs> Yeah, you know those that used to buy LPs. Those that used to buy LPs in those days. <laughs> oh, the <laughs> truth is that I did my time and I did my shift. <laughs> <laughs> you are still working hard for it. Don't worry, my brother. The, the, the point I want to make is that if you believe that ain't no stopping Nigeria now, just wave your hand. Just wave your hand. You can't stop Nigeria. You know, that, that, that's it. Uh, you know, thank you very much, uh, Bonga. Well, but, okay. but please, BRF, you guys should know that we have a, we have genius in the house, like I mentioned. <laughs> BRF, I, I won't join the debate of who is older between you and Amechi on this webinar. <laughs> okay. And he has the right to present when the debate goes on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Special Minister, when are we discussing airports? Congrats. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I want to congratulate well, uh, the federal I see that you are very, you're very excited. You are very excited on roads, but I think you should also focus on the vision. Airports, don't worry. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I want to it's, it's thank you. all our all the participants, our audience. Uh, we, we do not take your time for granted. Uh, like I did, uh, I apologize for, you know, exceeding the time. We were supposed to stop at 3 o'clock, but I don't think that anything has been lost. Uh, you'll agree with me that it's been a very riveting session, uh, highly informative, uh, and I think uh, the transparency with which this government approaches issues of PPP is something that is very uh, highly commendable. And we want to thank them. We want to appreciate everyone. Um, and I would also like to introduce CIPRA to you once again. Um, we, this is part of what we do at uh, the Center for Infrastructure Policy Regulatory and Advancement, CIPRA at the Lagos Business School. Uh, stakeholder engagement on issues of uh, importance to bring in private capital, private sector expertise into the infrastructure space in Nigeria. So we continue to explore other ways in which we will know, you know to boost collaboration between the academia, the industry, and policymakers to ensure that the right thing, sustainable development happens uh, in, a, in our plan. Thank you very much, and I wish you the best of time. Please uh, stay safe. Yeah, I mean, Bonga, just the last word, uh, we're on the transportation value chain. So after routes, you know, we're going to go to uh, airports. So the next session we'll do, uh, Bolaji, I can assure you his airports because, I mean, His Excellency President Mohamed Buhari for wants to build an intermodal Nigeria, rail, road, air. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.